Recording in progress. Yes, I can. And, and we are recording. Good evening, everybody. This is the Thursday, March 17th meeting of the Board of Directors of the Ann Arbor Area Transportation Authority. A quorum is present, and we can begin. Before we approve the agenda, what I, um, uh, well, I don't think we have a whole lot of people from the public here, but what I'll suggest is, um, in case we do uh, have people who want to comment on any of the agenda items, particularly the millage proposal, I'm going to propose that we move our labor and negotiations discussion to a closed session. We can come back on the record and vote, but the discussion will be closed session. Uh, so I'd like to move that into a, a closed session towards the end of the meeting after the public comment and before adjournment. Any other changes to the agenda? All in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed? Passes unanimously, thank you. Now we will open it up for our first round of public comment. If you are uh, on the phone or by video, uh, you may join either by hitting star nine or hitting raise the hand, raise hand icon uh, on your screen uh, when you are called upon. So Deb, do we have anybody who wants to address the board this evening? We do. Um, the first one, um... I believe it's Rachel Baird. I believe it's Jim Mogensen. Hold on just a second, and I will allow him to talk. You are unmuted. All right. So this is uh, Jim Mogensen. And um, so the first public comment, I wanted to make the comment on the, the, um, the, millage, uh, the millage proposal uh, introduction. And my first impression is that the authority may be getting ahead of itself. Um, I recognize why this is happening, um, but as a per but as a person who follows this and um, wants to be in in favor of these proposals, I have some concerns. So one of the thing was that we have this structural deficit, which was related to the 2014 millage proposal, and it's amazing to think that it was eight years ago, right? Um, but when that was happening, so why did that happen? And I remember when that was happening and the, and the technical people from AATA got together with the finance people from the county and they figured out exactly how much it was gonna cost. And when they did that, they decided they, they, they costed it out using low emission regular buses. And then the millage passed and then folks from the Energy Commission, I believe, came and said, no, we need to have hybrid buses. And a long stretch of negotiation happened and the staff didn't want that to happen. And they had those concerns which came to pass, but indeed we have that the hybrid buses were added to that proposal. And the second thing was that folks from the, um, Carolyn Graway and other folks from the uh, disability uh, community um, advocated for and got a little bit more robust uh, uh, ADA transit throughout the whole area. And as a result, as I understand it, that's one of the one of those the main reasons why the structural deficit is happening. So, what are the structural deficit issues with? What are the the, the potential issues with the current proposal? What if Ypsilanti Township removes itself from the authority? Then what happens? We don't have the proposal study. What happens if all of a sudden people say, no, we, we thought we were gonna have electric buses. How does that impact the proposal? And this is also the proposal millage as it is initially put forward, essentially enables the long range plan. And some of those things are long range plans. So as you're proposing this, and as we are up against its crunch of getting it done by April, and we're having a long range plan at the beginning of April, and then we're gonna have a decision on April 21st, so we can get ready for, right, by May, that we may be moving it too forward too fast, and we need, really need to slow it down a little bit and think through what those implications are, because it would be a real shame if things became a huge mess. So at the end of the meeting, I'll talk about the air ride and some other things. Thank you very much. Oh, and it's Transit Employee Appreciation Day. <laughs> or 5.1.1 on that note. Thank you very much for your... Uh, uh. Thank you. 
Deb, do we have anybody else who wants to address the board this evening? Yes, the next person is Tim Hall. You are unmuted now. Yeah, so Tim Hall here. I wanted to speak regarding the millage proposal. First of all, I'd say this is the first I've heard there is a deficit that requires a significant millage increase, even without any service increase. Can you try to better explain why this is? Is it COVID related or something else? Recent communications for the ride with restoring pre-COVID service levels haven't indicated anything was amiss, so I'm a bit surprised. Secondly, with respect to the proposed services, Increase. Will you be able to provide better details before this is voted on? When you did the last service expansion, you had proposed service schedules before voting on this. And I think you're going to need more information and education out there if we're going to pass a significant millage increase. Don't get me wrong, I support the ideas of increased night service. And if circumstances require a millage increase to fund existing service, I don't have an issue if that's a reasonable reason. However, I think you're going to require a lot more detailed information as well as outreach and education. And for that reason, I think you should reconsider doing this millage in August and either push it to November or split it into two millages, one this year to renew existing services and one next year for service expansion. Finally, if the ride is going to embark on another significant service expansion, they should do a reevaluation of the existing network and service frequency levels to ensure it's efficiently serving the ridership as it exists now, as opposed to how it existed pre-COVID. I know other agencies have brought in consultants like Jarrett Walker, who optimize their service levels and take a broad look at their network. And I think something like that makes sense here. And also for more coverage oriented service, I think it may more make sense to shift to flex ride rather than running a full 40 foot bus once an hour. <laughs> And uh, I guess that's uh, my comments for now. Thank you. We have one more um, with a raised hand, and that is Robert Palowski. And you are unmuted. Thank you, Deborah. Good evening, everyone. Robert Palowski here, calling in from Southgate, Wayne County. Uh, two things I'd like to address our board tonight. Uh, one of them will be safe for the second public comment period. But this is a topic I brought up to the RTA this afternoon with their board meeting and planning service meeting, as well as Auburn Hills City Council about a week ago. The issue with our millages is I think people are getting sick and tired of dealing with the same thing over and over. The fear that we're going to lose communities because of ridership levels, uh, property costs for tax owner, for people that own houses in these communities especially in Auburn Hills, a perfect example. And I just hate to see if we were to bring Celine into having transit in the city and they were to vote down on it uh, because of none of their residents don't wanna see it in the city or it's too much for them, including with their taxes, that's an issue. And there are people that work in Celine that actually live in Ypsilanti or even Superior Township. You know, I think people are getting sick of seeing the same thing and I think I don't know a single person, but I'm pretty sure most residents in the city of Ann Arbor or in Washtenaw County, some of them don't even support property tax. For example, Coast RTA down in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, the county, they operate out of two counties. It's mainly country, but they still manage to run a functioning system on time every hour. They've got the money to do it, and it's all funded by the state. That's what I'd like to see here with the RTA, especially with the ride for a system that's on the rise, especially with the long range plan. If we look at the bigger picture and start having the state fund this system instead of asking for property taxes, we'll start making this system thrive and we won't even need roadblocks in the way with unlike property taxes. So think of the bigger picture and let's move forward to keep the ride on the road for sure in our future to come. But as always, thank you for the time and opportunity to speak. Thank you. Deb, do we have anybody else? Oh, we don't have anybody else. All right, we'll close the public comment period and move on to 1.3 general announcements. Any general announcements to be made by the staff or board? Other than that, it is Transit Employee Appreciation Day. And we thank our transit employees for their service, especially through our uh, crisis. Uh, it's hard to call an ongoing thing a crisis, but our new reality that's been happening for the last 24 months. 
Thank you. Anything else? Now we'll move on to the consent agenda. In the consent agenda, we have board meeting minutes from February. Committee meeting summaries, the Public Transportation Agency Safety Plan, uh, and the raise grant application authorization uh, motion. Can I have somebody move the consent agenda into the record? Jesse, seconded by Rich. All those in favor of the consent agenda, raise your hand. Any opposed? It passes unanimously, thank you. We'll move on to section three, strategy updates from the CEO. And 3.1 is the long range plan presentation. Either Matt or Forrest can kick us off. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Well, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I think I'm just waiting for, okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, um, we, um, as you all know, uh, we have been uh, working on this long range plan since the beginning of last year. Uh, we did, uh, especially last fall, we had a, a very extensive public uh, engagement. And now we, uh, based on those feedback, uh, we developed this final uh, recommendations. Uh, we're gonna give you a quick overview tonight. Um, and then uh, the public engagement period for this round is gonna run from March 14 until April 15. Uh, multiple opportunities for public participation, uh, in-person meetings, virtual meetings, uh, lots of pre presentation being scheduled. So tonight, like I said, I'm gonna, we are just gonna give you a quick overview and then hear your feedback. I'm gonna turn that to Eva Grinsby uh, from Left Turn Right Turn, our consulting firm working on this long range plan. Thanks Forrest and thank you to everyone for having me here today. Let me just uh, share my screen and get our slides rolling. Okay, um, are the slides up now? Great. Uh, so again, thank you very much for, for having me here today. It's nice to see all of you and, and have a chance to present to you where we've gotten so far with our the long range planning effort and specifically to talk about the draft long range plan that we've developed based on extensive community input. I wanna take a moment and thank the board uh, and the broader community for their support and input along the way. Um, we've heard a lot uh, of different voices from different from from customers up through to elected officials and we feel that this plan that we're sharing today uh does a you know does a good job of trying to balance all of the different inputs that we've heard uh but ultimately we're we're very much looking forward to the dialogue and getting any additional feedback that this uh that this creates so as you know we started the project over a year ago and have come a long way in that time uh, today we're going to start just by refreshing all of you about the planning process that we've undertaken and we want to also share in some detail what we heard from the public and the broader community uh, about when we shared our ideas last fall finally we'll get into the details of the draft final plan itself and talk about implementation staging uh, and of course the cost of it uh, within that uh, ultimately we want to hear from you and we want to get all of your thoughts um, and through this session, as well as the many other sessions that we have planned, we are, we're going to collect the feedback from the public, customers, staff, elected officials, and the board, of course, and use all of that to finalize our plan for the greater Ann Arbor of Salenti area. So the Ride 2045 is a long range plan for the public transit services in, in the greater Ann Arbor of Salenti area. And the project itself considers the transit network. So what we mean by that is the bus routes and their frequencies, also new and better types of transit, new types of services, infrastructure, technology, and the vehicles that we're using to operate those services. Uh, I wanna, I'll, I'll mention this at a couple points, but I wanna uh, put a call out that we have a website for the project at theride.org where you can learn more about the work uh, as well as uh, some of the reports that we've Put together so far summarizing where where we what we've heard so far so the draft plan that's been developed was developed with a few specific goals in mind and these goals very much mirror the many municipal goals that we we heard early on 
So our intention through this work is to design a transit system that increases social equity by improving access to jobs, education, and housing, help the environment and reduce air pollution, and support existing and attract new businesses. Now these goals, oops, sorry about that. These goals were established based on what we heard from the community, from stakeholders, customers, and of course, you, the board. And the goals have been important in guiding how and which decisions we've made and the outcomes that we hope to achieve through those decisions. So the, the development of the plan has taken place over four phases. The first phase was guidance, where we developed the goals and methodology to guide decisions along the way. The next phase was analysis, where we looked at how the ride currently operates and how our community and transit is expected to change in terms of demographic, demographics, built form and technology over the next 25 years. In the third phase, we created potential scenarios based on, the, based on different levels of funding. And you may recall, we brought four of those scenarios to the public and stakeholders last fall for input. Now we're in the last phase of the project where we've narrowed in on a single draft plan for transit in the area and developed an achievable roadmap that lays out the steps over the next 25 years to build that future transit system and that which works towards meeting our goals. And quite frankly, I'm excited to, to be here to share that with you today and collect your feedback so that we can go away and do the work to finalize uh, the plan for you. So let's take a moment now to share what we heard from previous engagements that have guided us. So in the fall of 2021, we engaged with about 1400 people through surveys, online public meetings, in-person in public events, stakeholder meetings, direct emails, and social media. The full What We Heard report has all of the details around what we heard, and it's found on our website. Today, we wanna to focus on some of the bigger themes that came out of that engagement, and then share how we're using that feedback to drive our planning process. So last fall, we presented four scenarios based on different levels of funding, and people were asked to choose which was their favorite. The first scenario was to keep things the same with minimal new investment. The second was minor enhancements that just kept up with the projected growth in population and employment of the area. The third scenario was a modest enhancement with a larger investment in new and better services. And the final scenario, scenario four, involved making the largest investments to transform the transportation landscape in the Ann Arbor of Salantiria. I'm just going to pause here and, and let you absorb this image because I think we ourselves were a little bit impressed at the level of support by scenario four. A whopping 72% of survey respondents told us that they preferred that scenario. So the resounding response that we heard at these at the meetings and through our service survey was a desire not just for small improvements to the same system, for, but for deeply transformational change. By greatly improving transit, we can fundamentally change the way that everyone, not just current customers, get around the area. And that means less car usage, more equitable access to jobs, housing and education, and a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. These improvements do have a cost, but the thing that we were impressed by is that most people we heard from indicated that they are willing to pay for the investments if the benefits are clear. And if, when I mean by benefits, it's benefits to the broader community. So we focused on trying to show that through our work today. We also heard a broad desire for convenience, reliability, and dependability. Transit that is readily available at all times and to get people where they want to go. This means an extensive high frequency network with many routes operating at 15 minutes or better service. It means better off peak service and faster travel times on key routes using bus rapid transit or BRT, priority and express routes. Also better and faster connections across the greater Ann Arbor of Salanti area, as well as to regional destinations, whether you're traveling downtown or not. We also heard about concerns that we need to consider when making transit better. 
Any plan we make needs to be collaborative and work together with the universities, municipalities, and the Regional Transportation Authority, the RTA. We must also keep the costs in mind and be as efficient as possible with our spending so that the people affected by property taxes will see the benefits of their investments. And of course, we need to make sure that our plan is feasible, especially on busy and constrained roadways. Again, you can see the whole what we heard report uh, and the results of the last round of public engagement on our project website at theride.org. But now I wanna shift over and talk about the details of the draft plan itself. I wanna take a moment and sort of talk to you about our process and how we used the feedback from last time to inform where we want to build for with this work. So the, the feedback from the last fall was pivotal pivotal in building this, this draft plan that you see today. The transformational scenario, which was the clear preference last fall, was what we ended up using as a base for our work. To help manage costs, we made a small reduction in the total service hours and replaced some dedicated bus lanes with other transit priority features. We also optimized the network to minimize overall travel times everywhere. And for the service that we plan, plan to build, we are prioritizing areas with lower access to housing, education, and employment, as well as healthcare. Now, just before we get into the network map, let's take a look at some of the enhanced services that you will see on the next slide. So we have express routes, which are essentially an express bus service with limited stops that'll get you from point A to point B quickly. You'll see a priority services or priority routes, which are conventional buses that operate on a route that is somewhat enhanced by transit priority features like queue jump lanes, signal priority to help compete with traffic, traffic, and it also may have fewer stops than a regular bus route. You'll see bus rapid transit light, which is very similar to a full scale BRT or bus rapid transit. It uses the same large vehicles, but it does not operate on a fully dedicated or segregated lane. Instead, it uses transit priority to skip the congested intersections for a more reliable service. And then finally, you will also see full bus rapid transit using this, those larger vehicles operating in a fully separated or segregated lane so it never has to compete with traffic. Fair payment can happen before boarding the bus so that you can spend less, so that the vehicle itself is spending less time at stops, thus increasing or improving overall uh, improving overall travel times. All right, so this network map is how we imagine the ride could look in 2045. All of the routes here have been, select, have been selected to optimize travel times. And I just want to call out a comment from one of the public members earlier on about looking at the importance of optimizing. That's something that we're, we're keenly aware of and we've been discussing and worked with the ride as it relates to this. Um, and so, yeah, all of the routes here have been optimized, which will ensure that areas with low access to opportunities have access to high frequency transit. We have two full scale BRT lines shown in red, forming the backbone of our system. They will be a combination of full or dedicated lane BRT, as well as BRT light, sometimes operate at right, creating east west and north south connections. Other main routes are served by priority and express services shown in dark blue, which will have the transit priority features that I mentioned and fewer stops to make trips faster. We also will have an extensive high frequency network shown in light blue that stretches across the Arbor, greater Ann Arbor Salenti area, creating better, faster and reliable connections. And that high frequency network will be operating at 15 minutes or better service. Waiting and transferring will be improved everywhere, especially at our busiest locations with the upgrades to existing facilities as well as new transit hubs shown in those yellow dots. Other key elements in the plan include more off-peak service, which will help people who rely on transit for all their transportation and need it the most. This could include essential and lower age wage workers, women, students, and seniors. We've built accessibility into this plan at every level, including our vehicles, bus stops, transit hubs, fare payment, and information system. 
And as the whole system is transformed, we are able to ensure better integration and coordinated planning between all our services. This will include opportunities to integrate fixed route services with A-Ride. We are planning to modernize our fare collection and trip planning systems, which I'll talk about in a bit. And there will always be external factors beyond our control, which is why we are planning to expand partnerships with external stakeholders like municipalities, the RTA, universities, and community groups. One of the areas that we view as collaborations as being a, a potential opportunity is specifically around first and last mile solutions, helping people get to and from the bus. Every stop and station may require a different solution, whether it means on-demand services, bike sharing, scooter sharing, better sidewalks and snow clearing at stops. This will make it easier for everyone to use our improved high frequency network. So how we connect to the larger region surrounding our service area is critical to our success. And while the particulars of those connections depend on partnerships and outside funding, we have identified some key elements that we could work toward. Now on the map, the light green shows general areas where we can add more park and ride lots connected to our service area with express buses shown in dark blue. And that will help to draw riders in from a broader area by providing regional connections all around our normal service area. As I mentioned earlier, success for this will be dependent on uh, confirming or uh, identifying uh, sources of funding. It's important to stop and reflect on how these changes will help us reach our goals. Our changes will grow ridership by 150 to 165%. And this is thanks to the 39% faster service, significant increase in off-peak service, and dedicated investments in innovation and modernization. I talked about some of our goals earlier, and on the left, that we've listed them again on the left, and on the right, we want, we're trying to, to demonstrate how this plan responds to those goals. So first, we'll have a 100% increase in service across the board, with 123% increase in service for low opportunities areas we're reducing transportation emissions by seven to 11% and annual trips, annual car trips, sorry, will be reduced by 6.9 million. That's a lot of cars we're taking off the road. And we're also helping businesses by helping workers get to their jobs faster and more reliably through the high frequency network and other higher order transit investments. So these improvements aren't going to happen all at once. And what we've decided to do is look at developing impl implementation staging that breaks the next 25 years into five year chunks. So let's take a look at how the network or how the system could build out. So starting in the short term, between 2023 to 2028, our focus will be on the service improvements that require less infrastructure, but still increase equity, grow ridership and set the groundwork for future stages. So this includes a pilot express route on Washington Avenue shown in that dashed dark blue line and a minimum 30 minute frequency on all routes during the daytime, including weekends. What we heard from the, feed, from the feedback from the, the community last fall was that the people who are most dependent on transit needed at all times of day. So we're focusing our service improvements in this stage on providing earlier and later buses as well by expanding and enhancing night ride. Well, uh, sorry, by expanding and enhancing night ride. And our regular fixed route service will start to become more accessible, which al will allow better integration with a ride. The major capital pro projects that we will undertake in this phase include upgrading the Ypsilanti Transit Center and the Blake Transit Center, but we'll also start design work on other key infrastructure pieces, including a new garage, so we can have a, a larger fleet and deliver more services in subsequent phases, as well as planning for the design uh, and implementation of bus rapid transit and transit priority features. Moving to the second stage, starting in 2029, in this phase, we're looking at significant increases in service and an expanded bus fleet. We eventually plan to build a full BRT line on Washtenaw Avenue, but that will take time to plan and construct. So in this phase, we're going to enhance the express service that we introduced in the previous phase by 
implementing the BRT light that you see here with better stops, queue jump lanes, and more transit priority features along the route and throughout central Ann Arbor. We are also introducing an express route on the north-south corridor from Briarwood Mall to the Plymouth Road Park and Ride and creating priority services on the main Plymouth and Packard Ellsworth corridors. In this stage, we will construct the bus garage that we alluded, I alluded to earlier, and we'll also be constructing our first transit hub, this one near Briarwood Mall. From 2034 to 2038, our third phase, larger improvements will be made to the backbone of the network. This includes a full BRT now on Washington Avenue, a north-south BRT light from Briarwood Mall to Plymouth Park and Ride, where the express service was introduced last time, and a new express route on I-94 and a priority route on Packard Eisenhower. These upgrades will be coupled with, a tr with transit priority enhancements across the service area. We're also going to introduce or build out two new transit hubs here for Carpenter at the Carpenter Ellsworth area and Jackson Maple. In our last phase from 2039 to 2045, we will continue to upgrade the backbone of our network so that we can expand our high frequency network farther across the entire service area. So this includes a combination of full BRT and BRT light on the north-south corridor from Briarwood Mall to Plymouth Park and Ride and extending the east-west BRT with a BRT light extension on Huron and Jackson. We will also we will also build a new transit hub at Nixon Plymouth. And finally, we expect our fleet to be 100% zero emissions at this point, creating an efficient, convenient and clean way to get around. So that was a lot of information. Uh, I want to take a moment to summarize some of what the benefits are, as well as go over the costs. So the RIDE 2045 draft plan will improve transit in a few key ways, many of which you've already heard me talk about. It's going to, rep it, sorry, it creates an average of 39% faster service across the network, getting you where you need to go faster. There will be an increase in off-peak services resulting in minimum 30-minute frequencies on all routes at all times. On average, service will double near residences and will increase by 74% near jobs. And we're going to continue to focus investments to innovate and, mon and modernize the service. The result, which I shared earlier, is a massive increase of 150 to 165% in ridership. Now that type of ridership change, we would characterize as transformational by any standard. Um, and it will have real and measurable benefits across the whole community and not just customers. Our service enhancements will mean more equitable access to high quality transportation for jobs, education and housing. This means opportunities to those who need it most, more opportunities to those who need it most. More people using transit will mean more vibrant and walkable communities. And since transit is a more efficient way to move lots of people, our community will require less infrastructure such as parking, reducing the overall cost of transportation. Finally, fewer cards on the road means less pollution and a healthier environment for everyone. And of course, it also means reduced traffic congestion for everyone. Now, no one knows the future, so our plan gives us targets to reach for, but it also gives us flexibility as conditions and technologies change. We expect that the plan will be updated every five to 10 years. As our increases, as our services increase, the cost of providing those services increases too. And on this slide, we're showing the increase in day-to-day -day costs like employee wages, fuel and ma bus maintenance, those are the operating costs that you see here. They're paid for by local, uh, local property taxes, state and federal grants and passenger fares. So you can see how they, those are expected to grow. You can also see how the, the cost is going to require a significant level of capital investment. I'm just gonna flip over to the next slide where we'll give you a little bit more details on where that money is going. 
So let's take a closer look at where the investments are going in the, over the 25 years life of this plan. We expect to invest about $20 million into innovation and technology, $45 million into new vehicles, $113 million into new facilities, including the facility upgrades to BTC, YTC, the new bus garage, the transit hubs, and so on, and $175 million on the exciting bus rapid transit system that we've shown. Now, in spite of all of that, there's also a very fairly substantial portion that is connected to state of good repair and vehicle replacements, which you can see there, 298 million in all. So that's a lot of money that's gonna need to be uh, covered, it's gonna need to be funded. And we've been thinking about that as well. So the funding for these investments will come from different sources, as you would expect. 6% of the total will come from existing capital reserves. 47% 40, of the funding will come from existing state and federal funding programs that are stable and can be relied on for long-term investments such as this called formula funds. We also anticipate 31% of the funding will come from discretionary grant opportunities that are offered by the state and federal partners specifically geared towards big infrastructure projects such as BRT, as well as state of good repair projects. 16% of the funding sources have not yet been identified. And that may seem like a lot, but remember that over 25 years, we expect new and different opportunities to become available on, on the municipal, state, and federal levels. Overall, this financial plan is achievable, but also very important, flexible, should any surprises arise along the journey. So that concludes the description of the plan. And we're just in just a moment, we're gonna, I'll open it up and take all of your questions. I know I've shared a lot today and for anyone watching as well, um, I wanna point out all of the different ways that we're receiving feedback from the community and from the public. Again, details, more details are available on our website at theride.org. Um, we are accepting feedback through the myriad of, of paths that you see on the screen, including email, calls, uh, even snail mail, if you will. Um, and so we'd encourage you to share, I encourage you to share this through your network. We also have uh, numerous public engagement and meetings that we have planned. Uh, so we have a series of virtual meetings coming up um, on the dates shown there, March 29th, March 31st, April 6th, and April 7th. We also have three pop-ins uh, pop scheduled uh, in Ypsilanti Tra Transit Center, Blake Transit Center, and Ypsilanti District Library. We're working on some other engagement opportunities as well. So for anyone that's watching or listening today, I just again encourage you to monitor our website uh, and you'll be able to hear all about the different ways to reach us and ask your questions should your question not be addressed today. Uh, again, thank you very much for your time and look forward to discussion. Thank you. And thank you again for all the um, really hard work that's gone into this. This has been a very uh, creative and exciting process for all of us to watch. Um, and be a part of and uh, we really look forward to the shaping the future of public transit in this area through this plan. Uh, I'll turn it over uh, before the board gets started to Forrest or Matt to see if they have any follow up comments they want to make uh, before we open it up to the board for discussion. Forrest or Matt? Um, I don't, I don't have anything I, have we, anything. Just I just want to hear from you. Okay. Uh, then I'll turn it over to the board and ask uh, my colleagues on the board uh, who wants to begin with any comments or questions uh, on the long range plan at this point. Uh, we've seen a lot of this before, I know, so a lot of it is very familiar to us, but uh, any thoughts, final comments, feedback uh, on this long range plan? Yeah, I have a question. So you, you mentioned, thank, first off, let me say thank you for uh, the presentation. Uh, that was excellent. So thank you for all the hard work that you put into that. Uh, question I have for you is, you said that conditions, well, that uh, it's in five-year blocks, if I heard you correctly, and then that block will be dictated by changing conditions. Can I just have a sense of what conditions you think could be variables? 
Certainly, thanks for that question. Um, so yeah, so I think ultimately any plan like this needs to have flexibility built into it. And some of the conditions that you might, you know, that you would need to be responding to would be around specific, you know, the big one would be around funding, right? If certain changes to the funding formulas or what funding is available, that might trigger changes to how you build out and what you, you build out. But ultimately how the community changes as well, right? There's, you know, we do a, we did a fair bit of, of forecasting and looking at plans, municipal plans to get a sense of how the community is changing. Um, but you know, any planning exercise is never going to be perfect. And so that's why one of the key features of the plan is, you know, we have the, the, the structural elements in mind, such as, you know, we have a good sense of where more or less the BRT should go, but we don't know the specific, the specific alignment of that. And we don't know the specific alignment of every route because some of them aren't necessarily gonna be introduced for 10, 15 years. And it doesn't make sense to try to get to the nuance of saying, okay, you're gonna stop here and, and go down this road. Because again, in 10 years, maybe the, 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 the travel patterns will, will shift slightly. So those are some of the, 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 the conditions that could change. The other big one I would say is around technology. Um, you know, if you went back 15 years, I think a lot of the technologies that we have today, you know, you'd be guessing as to what would be the most prevalent, you know, smartphones, maybe we're starting to, to emerge, but no one would have expected smartphones to be as prevalent. And, and, you know, we're seeing a lot of activity right now around first and last mile uh, ideas, you know, bike shares, scooter shares, uh, micro mobility, but we don't know what from that is going to evolve and what will sort of materialize in terms of being viable. And so in the plan, what we've done is we've developed allocations for those types of innovation and modernization uh, investments. So that again, we, we might be able to provide some direction for the short term, but at least this way in the long term, the organization has a commitment really in terms of within their budgets to focus on and look for what are the innovations of the day to invest in, to pilot, to partner on, and, and hopefully to work to introduce to, to customers. Thank you. Other board members, Jesse. Uh, thank you, I kind of want to build on um, one of the things you mentioned, one of the things you talked about, uh, we talked about uh, route redesigns and you know, someone was asking about that before and I didn't see that mentioned in the presentation, um, you know, Changing routes is not an easy thing for us to do. There are lots of regulations in place. You know, we have to do a Title VI, uh, you know, uh, analysis every one every time we want to change something. So, how does the um, you know you, you talk about a like more of a um, transition to more of a grid system? How is that being implemented as part of this plan? Yeah, and I would say. Oh, sorry, I'm getting a bit of echo. Um, I, I would say the answer is gradually and and ultimately in a very uh, deliberate and methodol um, with a methodological approach. And we recognize the importance of and the, the need to do that type, type of Title VI uh, analysis before you, you go and implement. Um, and so, I mean, again, that's why we've been very careful with all of our, our communications, with the public, with the community to say, these are conceptual. Because again, when you're talking 25 years from now, you know, for a 25 year plan, you don't necessarily need the title six, but when you go to implement it in your, your five year annual service plans, that's when you would need to do that analysis to justify. Um, but we feel that, and you know, we've, we've working together with staff, you know, we have a strong, uh, yeah, like there's a lot of justification for a lot of the changes and, and ultimately all of these changes you know, we talked about one of the goals being around imp introducing or, or improving opportunities for people in low opportunities areas. Like those are the goals that are, we are using to drive these recommendations. And so when it gets later on, when, when, when staff and, and, you know, will have to develop the, the Title VI analysis alongside specific root changes, you know, because this has been designed with that in mind, I think it'll be a pretty straightforward effort to demonstrate that yes, this is actually going to improve the situation. It's going to provide better opportunity, better access to folks to get to education, to get to housing, to get to their jobs. Susan? 
Thank you for a great presentation. Um, a question I have it speaks to a comment made by one of our speakers earlier in the meeting, and he wanted us to be sure that the planning that we're doing has a reference uh, taking into account COVID and post-COVID, that this isn't planning that was done pre-COVID. Uh, we all know the world has changed. So could you speak to that concern that we heard from a member of our community? Yeah. I think so. We we the short answer is, and then I'll give a bit of a longer answer. Is the short answer is we, of course, we you know we we we're all living through it, and so we definitely took into account COVID and sort of what the best that one can speculate uh, will happen with a uh, with COVID, right? Um, but I think the general consensus when we did the research and sort of when in, in through our work and through talking to other professionals is that in the context of a twenty five year plan you know, COVID is not ex expected to have 25 year implications, that COVID in terms of, of ridership and travel patterns is expected to have a, an impact that's, you know, in the shorter range, in the five year range, maybe. And actually, uh, you know, we've, there's been recent uh, uh, numbers as of late, if you're look, if you look at agencies and transit performance and communities across, across the country, it's actually starting to rebound. We're seeing that due to the increasing cost of, of uh, gas, um, triggered by, of course, the, 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 the conflict that's occurring out in Europe. And that is actually bringing people back to transit faster than people thought. Uh, in some communities, it's only down you know, 10, 20%. I, I know with, with, in Ann Arbor, it hasn't quite rebounded quick, as quickly uh, in the last few weeks, but I think it's just a matter of time and certainly one of the the key elements around you know any transportation network is giving people a viable alternative to owning a car and this plan we believe does that and allow it will allow people to make the decision to get rid of the car the, a second car or maybe leave the car at home and and use transit to get to work or school more regularly um so so i think I, I don't know if I maybe wandered off of your question, but but you know we've we've thought about that and certainly built that into into our work as well. Thank you, Raymond. Yeah, I just want to uh, echo the praise from my fellow board members about a job well done. I'm really excited at the direction we're going with this. Um, I'm excited that we aren't um, shying away from being ambitious. And obviously there are gonna be trade-offs and some of those trade-offs are gonna be difficult in the future. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, we won't, we'll never achieve it if we don't aim for it and strive for it. So I, I'm, I'm very excited about the direction. Um, two specific questions about the presentation uh, were related to the slide, which showed bus rapid transit. And I was just, hopefully you could clarify a little bit for me. So the first was on Plymouth, if I saw the map correctly, uh, you were proposing BRT from Nixon all the way into downtown, but BRT light from Nixon to the east where the existing park and ride lot is, which I thought that was a little peculiar why you would kind of downgrade that facility for that small stretch, um, which connects to a major, in theory, attractor or destination for transit riders. And then um, the kind of complimentary question with that is, I, I think if I heard you correctly, you're proposing a new sort of transit hub at Plymouth and Nixon, and if you could maybe elaborate just a little bit about what is envisioned for that, what that means exactly, um, uh, that'd be helpful for me to understand. Well, just if, you, if it helps, I can bring up the slide just to uh, to speak to it. Yeah, oops, did I share the right screen? Let me try again. It was the right slide for a second. Okay, there, there, we, go. there we go. Yeah, so I yeah, think so um, you're you're referring to the the stretch up here in terms of wire and and but I think the same question is valid for for the other you know for all of these three stretches. Why are we we you know, for lack of a better word downgrading to BRT light? Uh, and and I would, the answer is quite simply to try to find the right balance between cost and service. And when we looked at the the you know the the level of service and sort of traffic and 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 um, and just demand for for service in that area. These were the areas where we felt we could switch from BRT in a separated lane down to a BRT light with transit priority features without necessarily uh, impacting uh, the the speed of the service as substantially. 
And so in fact, you know, in our analysis, we did account for a small reduction, but it's a not, you know, it's a, it's a much less of a reduction than say, if we had full BRT light uh, across uh, this north south corridor. Um, so that's, that's sort of how we ended up doing that or why we ended up doing it. It was sort of to recognize that there was some, some amount of, uh, or, or some desire to try to contain our costs uh, for the final plan. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the thinking behind that. Now you asked, uh, the second question was around the transit hubs. So the hubs right now are designed, sorry, I'm getting a little bit of an echo. I'm not sure if we can mute. Uh, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so the transit hubs are are designed to be uh, major focal points for connections, and so we would expect there would be both the ex the services that you're seeing here in terms of higher order transit, the BRT, the BRT light, also of course the higher frequency network, uh, but also some of the local a lot of the local coverage uh, routes that aren't necessarily shown here. They would all connect in efficiently at those hubs. And so we've actually allocated funding to build a, you know, some nominal structure at that location. Um, you know, you'd have improved amenities, you could have traveler information there. Uh, you could have, uh, you know, in some cases, there may be even opportunities to look at first mile, last mile uh, connectivity options there, maybe a bike share or a scooter share, some of those other ideas as well. I think the hubs, would be a great place to, to, to focus around development, basically. Uh, and so that's sort of how, you know, why, why we're putting those forward. Thank you, I appreciate that. The, the one follow-up statement I'll make is, um, I appreciate what you're saying about the, the switch from BRT to BRT light kind of on the periphery, but the trade-offs are higher the closer you get to four, right? So using state as an example, You've identified the BRT on the two lane section of state, but then when it opens up to the four lane section of state, BRT light, whereas it's actually easier to put BRT in the four lane cross section where you have the room to do so, and it'll be a lot harder to do it on the two lane profile where it's pretty much a dedicated transit lane and that's the only use. So I just bring that up just because I think. You know, yes, there might be some cost savings by transitioning from BRT to BRT light on the periphery, but I would think that those are fairly nominal because the real hard costs and the hard trade offs are closer uh, to the core where you have them as dedicated BRT so just something for consideration i'm not opposed mm -hmm. to it I think it's just um, an interesting conversation that we'll have to have as a community, as we get closer to implementation of those uh, plans. Certainly, and thank you for that we'll take that away and uh, and consider it. Kathleen. Yes, uh, thank you, Yuval. Um, what amazing work that you guys have done on this. My question still revolves around the transit hubs, and I'm trying to picture in my mind when we talk transit hub, are we just talking about a dedicated area like a uh, parking area or um, like a roundabout, so to speak, or are we talking about facility? a standing facility with possibly uh, staff to be able to do things like bus passes and things like that. Um, I'm trying to imagine what you actually mean by uh, a transit hub. So we do have, sorry, I think I'm off mute. Yeah, we do have in the in the budget that we've put, we do have funding in there for, for a nominal hub or for a nominal structure. It's not, we're not talking about a structure to the size of a BTC or YTC, but there certainly would be an expectation of something more than let's say just a shelter. Uh, so you'd have something in between almost. Um, and I, and as far as the, the question around, would it be staffed or unstaffed? We haven't gotten to that point of discussing. I don't, I don't think that the level of service at those locations would necessarily warrant having a full-time staff member there. Um, but certainly you could also look at other types of, of traveler information or customer service features. You could have kiosks, uh, ticket uh, or, or, or fair, fair product machines, things like that. There are, there are sort of in-between solutions that agencies have rolled out uh, quite successfully to, to make, uh, to help give these types of uh, uh, more, uh, you know, substantial transit locations, make them a destination, make them something more substantial to customers. 
I think the other piece around these that maybe I, I should have, I could also emphasize is they would also be a great opportunity for uh, integration with the, the neighboring communities and looking for partnerships with whether it's the, you know, Briarwood Mall or, or, or one of the other businesses or, um, you know, different, different organizations might have interests around how to integrate these hubs into the environment around it. So it's not just a, a you know, a, a transit node in the middle of floating in the middle of nowhere. Thank you. Rich, go ahead. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so I wanted to echo everyone else. It's been really awesome seeing the evolution from the first presentation that we saw to this one. So I mean, it definitely shows the, the, the team really listened to, especially the public comment. Um, a question I had, and maybe uh, there's just a piece of detail I think I just need to clarify, and it may cause me to ask a question, but in that map that you had up with Mr. Hess, uh, you were answering him, it was like of the overall transit network in 2045. The border between Pittsfield Township and City and Ann Arbor, I'm sorry, but I, I can't figure out what road is that? Is that Ellsworth? Is, I don't think that's Michigan Ave. Maybe it is. Sorry, um, maybe Forrest, Forrest, do you have the name off the top of your head? Sorry, it's Ellsworth. Um, Ellsworth. Oh, that is Ellsworth. Okay, so then I do have a question then based on that. Um, we talk about jobs and businesses in Ann Arbor, downtown central, right? It's, it's really hard for it to go up right now to support more businesses. So I think we are already seeing more and more of these businesses going outside of like i guess the downtown geographical area and that section there which on, which is showing in pistol township uh that's where like avis farms i think and, and a few other locations they seem to be expanding a lot and i don't know if we really support that area and so i think the bigger question i had is like how flexible will this plan allow us to be moving forward right because uh one of one of my uh, offices that I had for my, my current company was actually on Main Street by M14. And we weren't really able to have our team utilize the bus service because there was just limitations on where the buses could go, right? There wasn't a place on the turnaround. And so I'm just trying to figure out like with this area, whether, um, I know Pistol Township, we have a different relationship with them, but I'm just figuring out how do we support the businesses that are moving into that general area moving forward. And then say like even 30 or 40 years from now, I see us expanding even into other, whether it's SIO and our retire shop or even Superior Township, um, because businesses, that's where they have to go to get the, the locations. And so the concern I have is our ability to support people that need to get to those jobs. And then on top of that is, you already have that as like the partnerships with the different communities. Well, we are gonna have to really coordinate to figure out how do we get the, the the vehicles that we need to get to under there that they can actually service those areas. Mm -hmm. I think, Rich, a perfect example of that is is the new Amazon uh, hub yeah. that's going in Ypsilanti Township, sure. and how do we support people getting to those jobs? I mean, that's that's a real concrete example, along with the uh, Pittsfield Townfield uh, Townfield stuff. Yeah. So. Um... In terms of, we, we've had discussions with staff and we also, in the prior round of engagement, we actually met with the different uh, supporting, you know, the different townships, Pitts, Pittsfield, Sio, uh, Superior. And, you know, it's it sort of, it, it's hard to read on this map, but we recognize that there is an opportunity to improve connectivity. And that quite frankly, the success of transit from a regional perspective will be around improving connectivity to some of these as you said, peripheral areas. Um, in the scope of our work, you know, which was the member municipalities, you know, this is sort of where we were able to look. And because of the current funding arrangement, it was it's hard to, to make too many firm commitments about what transit should look like to Pittsfield, for example, or SIO uh, or Superior. But absolutely, we recognize the demand is there and we recognize the opportunity is there. And I think it's a question maybe for this board more broadly, and uh, to, to consider around, yeah, what, how do we engage with these partners? Um, and how do we look to grow the service effectively to those through, you know, whatever contractual relationship that you have? Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. Forrest, I see you're off mute. Maybe you want to jump in too? Sure. Thank you, Bob. Um, that's really a great question. 
Um, I think, uh, like uh, Yvonne mentioned, this plan is focusing on three members. Anything outside, uh, we do have a, you know, a service agreement. Um, it's I, I, current, based on current arrangement, it's almost their decision how much they want to invest in transit services because they have to pay. Uh, but our plan after this long range plan uh, is finished, uh, we're going to reach out to them, work with them. Uh, look at their land use, uh, their projections, and see what, what is the best transit plan in each uh, municipality. And then we can incorporate into our long range plan, you know, work to extend our network, uh, particularly service uh, within their own municipality, uh, because the, we consider that as a local service. But anything network related, you know, relate to our entire service area is covered here. You can see a lot of lines in PCO and they're in SIO2 in Superior because anything we currently cover, we do consider it as part of this network design. But anything else beyond that uh, would be part of the further uh, future discussion, uh, which with them. Uh, so hopefully it will happen next year or two. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, and I'd like to also respond. I think it's an excellent question, uh, getting at the the issue of transportation and land use, and it is kind of a chicken and the egg uh, moment. Uh, we haven't most of what we've presented this evening is about the supply of transit service, not so much the demand for it, but the supply for it, and how that would be optimized. And Forrest and Yuval, I think, did a good job of explaining that there are different types of services, sometimes more flexible, the ways we could reach out into what we might think of sort of peripheral uh, developing areas, uh, and certainly areas along Ellsworth, I think, fall into that category. Um, there's, and, and we certainly can approach it, and I think this map helps explain that. There's another element in the in the mass in the, uh, in the in the long range plan that we haven't talked about as much, but we did talk about in the early days, and I brought it up under the the banner of advocacy. Um, but that also sort of got into how much do we want to attempt to influence land use decisions, because one solution, Rich, to the the scenario you had, was that we can provide more service on peripheral areas. The other one is we can attempt to get municipalities to build bigger and better office space where we already have the service. That is uh, that is very much working on the demand side of the supply demand equation. So that is, uh, I think, referenced in here. Uh, most of this uh, plan is really focused on the supply side of it and, 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 and how we would design these services but I don't wanna lose track of that advocacy feature as well and our ability and you know, willingness, frankly, uh, to, to engage the municipalities in those conversations because it's really them who set the land use rules and we respect that, but uh, we could be uh, more of a player in that uh, space if we wanted to. I think it's an important point. It goes to something Ryan first said, which is that one of the key variables is going to be not just living patterns and traffic patterns, but employment patterns, right? So, I mean, you know, I mentioned before, Ypsilanti Township is getting some major new employers in there. They're part of our jurisdiction, right? And so, you know, getting people to those jobs in mass is gonna be, it's gonna have to be part of this plan. I mean, we can't, we just simply can't ignore that and say it's all about getting to one downtown or another. Uh, but that's going to be, a, 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 you know, to Yuval's point about flexibility and variables, that's going to have to be baked into this plan to say, hey, you know, if we need a BRT between this park and ride and this major employment hub that's going to pop up in, you know, one of these townships or one of these areas, it, it's just going to have to cover that. That's all there is to it or else we lose relevancy. Uh, anybody else? Mike, anything from you? I think he's shaking his head. All right. Anything else from board members on this? Once again, thank you very much for uh, the presentation, the material, all of your hard work uh, and reach out and contact with the public. Very much appreciated. We look forward to uh, developing this. And I think you're, 
as you said before, free to go back and finish finalizing the plan now. So Thanks. thank you. I just one, one more, if I may, one more shout out that I, I neglected to make, which is on me, shame on me. We actually had a really fabulous public advisory group, 12 representatives of the public from representing all of your communities with very different backgrounds that we've been working with at different points that have helped us get here. And so I just wanted to give uh, acknowledge that group as well, because I realized in my notes earlier, I, di I didn't. So uh, thanks again to uh, the board for all of your input and thanks to the broader community. It's been, it's been a really fun and exciting project. So thank you. Indeed, thank you for that recognition. Thank you again. I know. All right, closing that out, we'll move on uh, to millage proposal introduction and Mr. Carpenter is taking the podium. He's going to take the podium shortly, or maybe he's going to go back to his seat and do it from there. I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully he hasn't changed his mind and run out the building. Yes. Go ahead, Mr. Carpenter. I'll take it over to you. I'm here all night. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, uh, members of the board, members of the public who are with us uh, this evening uh, virtually. Uh, that was a very good uh, presentation from left turn, right turn, and Yuval and his team. Uh, what I'm here to do is to follow that up the long term plan with the short term plan. And I am going to walk uh, the board through uh, a millage proposal that begins on page 53 of your packet. I would encourage anyone uh, uh, reading along at home uh, to go there as well, and you'll see a lot of similarities there. What I'll do this evening is to provide an overview of the uh, process and the development process of the millage proposal. I will then go uh, through the proposal uh, in each of the elements at a high level. I'm not going to read the memo. Um, I would encourage everyone uh, to, to look at that, but certainly in our discussions, uh, you know, we will respond to, to those questions uh, from the board members. I'll note that our intent here is only to introduce this uh, today for your consideration. I do not expect or, or I'm not seeking any sort of decision. Uh, we'll talk about the timing considerations uh, for the, uh, the date of the election. Uh, and then next steps, the overall timeline for implementation, and then open it up for your discussion and questions. So Yuval's presentation on the long range pan, I think is a really important predecessor to this conversation. This five-year millage proposal is drawn almost as a copy paste from the long range plan, direct lift of, of the material, uh, building on what we've heard from the public. This is the first stage of implementing that emerging long range plan. So when we have had uh, discussions with the public about, about the long range plan. We've been saving that information and using it to help us craft this proposal. When we were out in October to talk about the scenarios that uh, you've all mentioned, one, two, three, four, we explicitly showed the level of service that you would get with each one and the costs. As you've all mentioned, we explicitly in the presentations and in the presentation boards that we had at public meetings said option one has no co no additional cost option two the millage goes up option three more option four more that was very important to us because it's easy uh to ask everyone what do you want and yes we want it all it's a little bit harder when the dollar sign is right there. So we were very intentional last year about when we asked people, what do you, would you like the transit system to be? We wanted them to see the price tag uh, with it the right there as well. And you've all mentioned being, I think impressed maybe was the word he used. Um, and one of his slides, I think slide seven, he showed you the pie chart of the responses that we heard. Which one of these scenarios do you want? And you know, I'll be I'll be honest when I when I see a one, two, three, four, I expect the score to be sort of in the middle. Uh, I was impressed as well as you've all with how convincingly, overwhelmingly, the reaction from the public really leaned heavily towards what you've all called a transformative option. 
a very aggressive option that I think uh, uh, can, can be a revolutionary change in how public transportation is organized and functions in this area. So when we talk about this five-year millage, we are talking about the long range plan. We are talking about the information we got from the public. This is a direct response to what people have told us from the long range plan, uh, simply stripped out for the, the, the stuff that was ready to go first and put in here. So I wanted to draw that very strong connection to the long range planning process. So what is in this millage proposal? It recognizes the opportunity to maintain all existing services that the ride provides. It provides several opportunities to enhance, expand, and improve public transit services throughout our, all of our communities uh, in various ways. It's important for a wide number of uh, uh, rider demographics, but really I like to think of it for the entire community. This is a, a mass transit system. It's not for one person, it's not a taxi. Uh, this is for everybody, but it certainly matters most uh, to, to many of the folks in our community who rely on public transit for a variety of reasons, seniors, persons with disabilities, persons who maybe have constrained incomes, um, workers. This, is, this was not a new issue before the pandemic, we had a labor shortage, uh, but getting, and we sometimes call it labor mobility, but getting employers and workers be able to get them together is a critical part of this. But then also we see a real societal mindset change. And I came of age, uh, you know, late 80s, early 90s, and there was talk about transit and there was talk about the renewal of cities, but it hadn't happened yet. What we see now is a very different society than what I saw when I was younger. And I see uh, particularly younger folks, but not just younger folks, setting a, a very different course of lifestyle in terms of their choices. They're fine with their phone getting in an Uber. They're just as fine getting on the bus to get where they need to go. And this is stuff that a generation or two ago might have been hard to imagine, but today seems to be occurring more and more rapidly. So there's a whole lot of folks who would benefit uh, from this, but I like to think of it as a benefit to the entire community. It does advance your goals. And I will speak a little bit more about the goals that you have set as a board for this agency and how this millage uh, reflects those, but it also reflects the community's goals. Uh, the goals set out by our various partners, I'll mention them as well. And as I said, it aligns very much with the long range plan. And then finally, you'll excuse me a little bit as we get into this, we are gonna talk numbers. And one of the exciting things here is about maximizing uh, what was one time referred to me as OPM, other people's money, particularly state and federal. There are ways we can uh, adjust how we use our money to maximize the money that we get in from state and federal governments. So we're looking forward to bringing home the bacon. Clarifications on the process for a ballot measure. I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page. Um, our enabling legislation, Act 55, does enable you as the board of the ride to place a ballot measure on, uh, on an election referenda. And that is what we're talking about. Here at the ride, uh, it's the responsibility of staff and the CEO to prepare an initial proposal for your consideration. That's what we're here to discuss this evening. The board, you can accept that proposal, change that proposal, uh, proposal, replace any element of it, throw it out and start over. The decision is entirely in your hands. <clears throat> Our proposal is really just to get the ball rolling, if you will. Ultimately, <clears throat> not tonight, but ultimately you will need to vote on the mill rate, corresponding ballot language, and a specific date that you wish or to place the referendum on a ballot. I wanna speak a little bit about the broader process for how the long range plan is being developed and how this millage uh, speaks to that. We see in the largest circle here, the direction that you as a board set for this organization. These are your goals, what here internally at the ride, we sometimes call the ends policies. These are your strategic outcomes. It's your expectations for what we will achieve. And you also have a variety of other policies. You set that based on consultation and input from residents and our municipal members, what we sometimes call our moral and legal owners. Those policies are your instructions to me and the rest of the staff about what the organization is to achieve, for whom and at what cost. 
staff have decided the best way to organize ourselves uh, uh, to, to, to find the best way forward is in the development of the long range plan. And I will tell you, even as someone who's been doing transit plans now for a, a long time, I'm very impressed with the, the, the degree of detail that Yuval and his team have taken this down into. This is almost an engineering exercise at this point. So a long range plan, I think, is a very precise and impressive uh, piece of work and has not been developed in a vacuum. A great amount of public involvement has gone into that plan as well and correspondingly into the millage. As I see, as I said, you can see on the right hand side of the screen, the, the short term millage, the five year millage is really derived entirely from that long range plan from the feedback we got from the public. It is simply the first step in a, in, in a long journey. <clears throat> Very quickly talking about, and you've all alluded to the guidance. Where did uh, the guidance from the long range plan and this millage come from? As I mentioned, your goals, your ends policies, to radically oversimplify them. You've directed us to increase social, environmental, and economic sustainability in this community by enhancing public transit and hopefully attracting uh, more people to the service by increasing transit ridership. That is our best metric to know that we are relevant, as the chair said. But it was not in isolation there. We see a variety of our partners throughout the community uh, creating their own policy documents in a variety of ways, voted on and approved by their municipal councils or boards. Uh, great examples include the A20 uh, and uh, plan from the city of Ann Arbor and a climate action plan from the city of Ann Ypsilanti. Uh, these, these plans are focused on environmental sustainability, but they think about transportation very seriously and they see a very strong role for increasing ridership on public transit and they call for us they call for someone but sometimes explicitly us this agency to expand public transit service to make it faster to make it more attractive and we see similar uh, calls for expanded access to opportunity uh, in the county the county has done i think some really interesting work with their opportunity index if you haven't visited that tool i think it is very enlightening about where we see the greatest social needs in our community, because it's not just about the environment, that we have to take care of each other. Um, uh, the economic equity analysis and affordable housing work that was done, I think, in 2014 also calls for expanded public transit. So this, wherever we look throughout our service area, when we look to our other peer organizations, to our municipal members, they are setting a very strong course for us where they want us to go in a ambitious transformative direction, they call for such. As I mentioned, the public has also been very much involved in the uh, development of the long range plan and starting today, or starting Monday, I should say, uh, this, this millage proposal as well. We welcome their feedback. We have a number of channels available for them. Uh, here with you, I think is the primary one, but we do also have uh, on our website, a variety of ways for people to give us feedback or ask questions about the millage proposal specifically. Um, I'll note that throughout the long range planning process, dozens, dozens of meetings, virtual and in person, online surveys, telephone surveys, all, over 1400 people uh, have been involved in this process. And then, uh, as I mentioned, in the most recent round uh, in October, that's when we shared, you know, four scenarios, what would you which one do you like? By the way, here's the price tag associated with them. So we feel there was a very strong connection for that. And as we saw, 72% of people said, we, we like the ambitious one, we like the transformative one. That's the kind of community we wanna be. So I think that's an important signal. So with that, as an overview of the process and the, the key inputs, I'd like to dive into the meat of the proposal. <clears throat> Excuse me. The proposal structure is uh, based around the deliverables that you as a board will need to vote on, the specific ballot language, the mill rate contained in it, and the date. The date of the election is simply, whether it's August or November or another year, uh, that it would be placed on the ballot. The ballot language, uh, when it really revolves around the content of the millage, which revolves around the mill rate. Is this a renewal? Is this a replacement? Is this an expansion? That discussion drives the ballot language. So your discussion uh, and decision eventually around this proposal uh, will be used by our corporate counsel, Dykema, to help draft ballot language that reflects your decision. And then you can 
officially vote on that or edit it and then vote on it if you so choose. The mill rate is composed of two broad categories. There are actually 10 elements to this proposal and we've grouped them into two categories to help uh, make it a little easier to understand. The two categories are uh, elements necessary for maintaining the existing services we already have and optional elements that we're calling service enhancement options. And I will go through them all now uh, briefly. I would say for anyone following along in your packet, again, starting on page 53, you can begin to see much greater levels of detail uh, than I'm going to present uh, just now. So maintaining existing services. <clears throat> this is composed of four elements, renewing the existing millage. We do have an existing millage of 0.7 levied across three communities, an allowance for a deficit, allowance for inflation, and staffing requirements. I'd like to speak about each of these very briefly. The renewal of the existing millage is a, a legislative requirement. Uh, our millages can only go for five years and our current one is due to expire. I'll be speaking about the timelines in a little bit more, but that is, that is funding that is absolutely essential simply to, to keeping the lights on, keeping the wheels turning. The deficit allowance, and we did have a caller uh, in the public comment time uh, mentioned that they, they hadn't heard about this. So I want to provide a little bit of background to this. Uh, starting in 2013, uh, the ride uh, laid out some ambitious opportunities um, and ultimately achieved our first new millage in, in many years in 2014. Um, we were very optimistic, I think, and, and had a lot of uh, ambitions and those were good. And they've made a lot of difference in the community. The services, for example, the new services on Washtenaw Avenue uh, that were implemented in 2013 have been very, very valuable. A lot of people you know, pre-pandemic and since have benefited from those services. <clears throat> However, starting in 2017, as I believe the board is aware, uh, we realized that the, the mill rate of 0.7 was not adequate to cover those costs. We had also shifted some federal capital formula funding, pardon the jargon, uh, from capital functions to operational functions, setting up sort of a compounding problem uh, that eventually meant we wouldn't be able to replace our bus fleet, which for a transit agency is a big problem. So that deficit is something that we have been grappling with since 2017 when we became aware of it. <clears throat> yeah, you may recall in, in 2018, we renewed our 0.7 mill, millage. That was a very conscious and explicit decision by this organization saying that this is a difficult thing. We now realize it will take more money to sustain these services than the community uh, was told initially, but we're gonna try to make it work. We're gonna tighten our belts. That was on top of, I need to be clear, several years of, of sort of um, deferred maintenance deficits and other things building up uh, in the back office, if you will. So since 2018, we've been working hard to make it work. Um, but the reality that we came to this conclusion some time ago, uh, we had pinched the penny as far as it could go. Uh, and, and we were on a course for structural deficits. Before the pandemic hit, our budget documents, which are available on our website, very clearly laid out uh, the forecasts, uh, I think as far back as 2018. Um, the pandemic did disrupt that and then gave us a little more breathing room in that respect, but it did not fix the deficit problem. So I want to be very clear, particularly because of the caller's comments, deficit here has nothing to do with the pandemic. It predates that, uh, but we do have an opportunity uh, with this millage to correct that and continue to provide the services that so many in our community have come to rely on. <clears throat> Inflation. Um, we had a lot of discussions internally about how to distinguish uh, costs in the past that were the deficit versus resulting from inflation. We've decided they all just need to be characterized as deficit. Inflation is about inflation going forward. Um, we do receive uh, revenue from a variety of sources, particularly property taxes, fares, and state and federal grants. Uh, what some people may not know is that although our property tax revenue does grow, it doesn't necessarily grow as fast as inflation. It's linked through various state laws to the consumer price index, which is what we pay as individuals. It's not the best measure of inflation for an industrial business like ours. 
those inflation measures are captured by other things from the Bureau of, 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 of Labor Statistics and others uh, uh, that, that frankly reflect a longer term prognosis that costs for businesses tend to rise differently than they do for individuals. Uh, this has been true now for several years. Um, I should also mention that our fair revenue has not grown at all because we have not increased our fair rates. That was an intentional decision so that the services could remain affordable and, and something I think we all support. Uh, state and federal grants are also not directly linked to inflation all the time. Some of them are, but many of them are not. And some of them are a bit of a crapshoot year to year in terms of what are you actually going to get. So although our property tax revenue does grow, it does not grow fast enough. Uh, we have been historically left with a, a, a leftover unaccounted for bit of inflation ranging from 1% to 1.5% a year. Cumulatively, this adds up. We are not alone here. Every municipality and every uh, property tax funded organization in Michigan struggles with this same reality. Uh, uh, you can talk about the Headley Amendment or Prop A, but the reality is that this is the state law that, uh, that we work under. So that was before, maybe six weeks ago, six months ago, when inflation took on a, 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 a it became a nasty word, a word we haven't really talked about since the 80s in some respects, uh, and it became a much faster growing thing. Uh, we have been seeing spikes in a variety of our costs, um, many are growing at 3% in our detailed budget, but things like insurance, oddly enough, have shot up at 12% during the pandemic. Uh, salaries and wages rising faster, as we can all see, there's very different approaches to manpower and staffing uh, as we go forward. And let me tell you about fuel. We consume a lot of fuel because we're a transportation agency. Um, we, we are at the mercy of the markets and, and to a degree, Vladimir Putin, I, I never thought I would say that. Um, we have a, back at headquarters, a massive underground diesel storage tank at tens of thousands of gallons of diesel. Just to give you an idea of how we're doing this now, we used to sort of keep that thing half full. Most of the time tanker truck would come by and pop it back up. I've asked Brian and, and Troy and fleet to let's keep it actually topped up because I can't guarantee that we aren't going to have some sort of disruption to fuel supply lines. That just gives you an example of how much it's changed. And certainly uh, the prices that all of us are seeing at the pump, we are completely exposed to those as well. Uh, the volatility in the inflation market is something that we, uh, that we have to address going forward. Finally, staffing. <clears throat> Since 2015, uh, we have cut 9% of the administrative positions at the ride, 9%. Uh, we are lucky to have such a dedicated and talented workforce, but I'm gonna be frank with you, sometimes feel a little guilty about how much I've asked of them over the last uh, seven years it's been. Um, there's been a number of challenges. Uh, uh, the cyber attack uh, recently being one of them where we've really benefited from the heroic efforts of an incredibly dedicated workforce, but attempting to tighten our belt in 2018 did mean beginning to reduce uh, the number of people we had, repositioning people's jobs somewhat, you know, that can, that can be a little uh, uh, stressful at times. I think we've done a reasonably good job of this, but it's very apparent even before the pandemic uh, that the staff, uh, we have a lot of expectations for the organization in this community. Every day we get a new request for another idea or a new opportunity and trying to keep track of them all is, is, is a full-time job. So we are uh, asking the board to consider allowing us to increase the administrative staff complement, excuse me, not totally administrative, it's a mixture of administrative and off, uh, operational positions to help us reduce the burden on staff uh, that we already have, meet all the expectations that we have today and begin really to move forward on some of these exciting new ideas. Um, when we look at some of the ideas in the long range plan, the big hubs uh, and other uh, projects, someone's got to oversee that. Someone's got a project management. Someone's got to send out the request for proposal and hire uh, the consultant. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in all of these areas. So uh, without that fourth item of staffing, it will be difficult to maintain 
uh, the, the level of operational capacity that we have. So uh, there's more detail in the board packet on all of these items. I'd like to move along to the service enhancement options. These are presented uh, uh, in a table that I'll reference in a moment. I'm gonna go through these uh, quicker, uh, one by one. Uh, these are all optional service expansions, improvements, enhancements that the board could consider. You can consider them individually or as a group. Any combination of approving any of these is viable. All, none, every second one, whatever you think is, is most uh, appropriate. Uh, these do add a considerable amount to the eventual mill rate, as we'll see, but I'd like to give you just a quick overview of what all of them mean. Ann Arbor to Ypsilanti Express, a downtown to downtown express bus route we're operating on Washtenaw Avenue with only four stops. We can cut a 45 minute trip down to about half an hour. That kind of one third reduction in travel time is in our business huge. It particularly is important for people traveling to work. For example, West Willow residents in Ypsilanti Township by, uh, by the airport have some of the longer commutes. And you see in the, uh, the county's opportunity index, frankly, an economically isolated area. Getting those folks access to jobs is very important. This would help do that. It also helps alleviate labor constraints here in Ann Arbor. I don't want to suggest that the only or best job opportunities for folks in Ypsilanti are in Ann Arbor. One of the things we've really picked up on through the long range plan is that there's a sensitivity to that. And so we'll talk about how other proposals also help labor mobility and workers move within the Ypsilanti area. But this one is a, a particular uh, uh, service that we think can precede bus rapid transit on this corridor, build a market, particularly valuable for workers, employers, students, as well as people traveling to the hospital and, and other social uh, opportunities. It effectively brings Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti closer together in time by reducing that travel time. Longer hours of operation system-wide. In, right now, uh, we have uh, services that run till 1145, some run to 10, some run a little later. It's not entirely consistent. We also hear a lot of uh, comments from the public during the long range plan discussions. They would like the service to operate later even than we do today. So what this initiative would do would to frankly harmonize uh, most or all of these start and stop times uh, to bring them all all up to a, a wider span or longer hours of operation, we sometimes say. Uh, what this would primarily mean is longer hours of evening service on many routes in the week weekends and weekdays. And then interestingly, Saturday service starts late. We'd like to start it earlier at the same time, like 8 a.m. Uh, uh, 7 a.m. Instead of, instead of 9. <clears throat> Element number seven, is increasing the, frequent, the frequency of weekend service. And this is really, uh, we've heard the term before, frequency equals freedom. How frequently that bus comes determines your um, independence, your flexibility in trip making. So if a bus comes every 60 minutes, you really have to build your life around that schedule. If a bus comes every 30 minutes, you have a lot, you have twice as much latitude. This is incredibly important for people who are traveling off peaks on the weekends. Yes, there are a lot of workers in this period, but we should not forget there's a lot of seniors traveling uh, in these times as well, as well as persons with disabilities and low income. This also matters for folks uh, who want to, you know, ditch that car, or that second car, like uh, you've all mentioned. Uh, if if our service works well for you five days a week, but then it falls down on the weekends because it's not frequent enough for you to do your business. It kind of falls short there, so this this would increase uh, all of the frequencies up to I think 30 minutes. <clears throat> now this is an important one, uh, and it goes back to what I was talking about about increasing mobility uh, within uh, the the eastern part of the county and the Ypsilanti and Ypsilanti Township area. Uh, many people don't know because some of us are in bed that the ride does run 24 hours. We don't run the big buses all night long, but we have for years had a service called Night Ride. It's an on-demand service. In years past, it was provided by taxis. Today, it's provided in other means. 
And presently, for simply historical reasons, this service was primarily provided in the city of Ann Arbor. And you can see that on this map, which is lifted directly from the Washtenaw County Opportunity Index. What you see in this map is the areas of blue have a higher overall opportunity score. The areas of red are the areas that score lower. When you look to the Opportunity Index, you'll see that's made up of educational opportunities, employment opportunities, healthcare access, and other critical features. So this is a very important tool. If you haven't used it, I encourage it. So Night Ride started in Ann Arbor, still there. Uh, eventually, it grew to expand up the Washna Avenue Ellsworth corridor into the heart of Ypsilanti, but not the entirety of Ypsilanti. We needed to connect to the other terminal, I think is what was probably going on here. But it was never expanded to cover everything. Over the last couple of years, we've made, I think, important strides at harmonizing or equalizing the services that this community, that this agency has provided, bringing every uh, community up to the same level uh, of service. This is, we think, the last remaining part and an important one. So what you see here is the red area circles uh, just a quadrant of Ann Arbor, but all of the city is covered. Um, the, uh, that's where Night Ride operates today. The dotted yellow line is where we would be proposing in this initiative to add it, to expand that service so that overnight service and holiday service, I believe, um, would be provided uh, in this entire area. If people wish to travel to a job in Ypsilanti Township uh, on a swing shift, for example, this could do that for them. If they want to come to the terminal and catch a bus into Ann Arbor, they can do that as well. Similarly, if they're coming from Ann Arbor into Ypsilanti, this can help get them home. So this is an important uh, bit of uh, social uh, uh, equity, but also an important service gap that we need to fill or that we would like to fill. Similarly, in, in, uh, in Ypsilanti, uh, I think many people know we have two bus terminals, one in Ann Arbor, the Blake Transit Center, the other in Ypsilanti, the Ypsilanti Transit Center. Both of them are, are, are good buildings. Uh, both of them have um, uh, customer service agent space. Uh, the entire time I've been here, there have been staff, customer service agents at the Blake Transit Center. Uh, we have not had a customer service agent stationed at the Ypsilanti Transit Center, certainly in my time here, and not in recent memory from any staff who are here. I do not know why, to be perfectly frank. I suspect it has to do with money. Um, what we would like to do here is hire more customer service agents to staff the Ypsilanti Transit Center during weekday regular business hours. Um, uh, we bring them up to an equivalent level of service that we see in Ann Arbor, providing all the same services that we do in Ann Arbor, answering questions, helping with wayfinding, selling fares. Uh, we do have some media, fair media, where we need to take your picture. We would find a way to do that. Um, and, and we do, as a part of this, uh, really need to bring that space up to an equivalent standard uh, of what we have in the Blake. Uh, we do have aspirations to knock the Ypsilanti Transit Center down uh, in the next five to 10 years and build a better transit terminal there. So we might go to Ikea for the better furniture, but we do need in addition to the staffing to, to freshen up the space uh, in that building as well. Again, an equity issue, but also something that drives ridership to have someone there to explain how to use the service, to sell you a fare, to answer the questions. This is an important element of attracting riders that we have been doing without for a long time. The tenth and final option uh, or element to this proposal is for funding major capital projects. And this is a unfortunately complicated uh, discussion, but essentially what this would do would be to add funding uh, for us uh, to, to save up so that we could afford to build major fixed asset investments, things that are very lumpy in their funding. They're not nice, you know, like 10 bucks a year, it's 100 bucks all at once big capital projects. In this regard, what we're talking about here are things like garages, passenger terminals, the heavy investment necessary for zero emission bus fleets, uh, bus rapid transit. These are heavy investments uh, with big upfront one-time costs. Now, we have a, this is how we can maximize federal and state revenue. Um, here uh, in Michigan, uh, 
we're lucky that the state will give about 10 to 20 percent match any federal funds uh, that we give. So if we got 100 bucks from the feds, they would give us 20. We need to maximize that. Um, we also need to save up money to afford what is effectively a 50% match. So if bus rapid transit costs $80 million, and buried in Yuval's presentation is that implication, uh, the federal government will pay 40 million of the capital costs, but the other 40 has to come from us and the state and some other source if we're lucky. Uh, so we need to begin to save up to be able to have the latitude to do that. I don't want to go into too many details, but as I mentioned with the deficit, we shifted some formula of capital funds from capital to operations. We would use these through this millage, the new property tax funds to shift that back there. And that allows that money to be used as it was initially intended uh, by the federal government. This is uh, directly from Yuval's presentation. This is the slide about the, where would the money come from? I wanted to, to reiterate here this to say we know we can pay for 47% of the long range plan through funding sources that we already have. The capital reserve may be able to pick up another 6%, but the red and uh, uh, yellow, that's the funding gap. It was discretionary. Discretionary is another term for competitive. You got to hustle for that. You got to win that. And the unidentified sources kind of in the same bucket. So. When we talk about the need to save up, this chart I think does a really good idea of helping us get our arms around the scale of, of capital that we're gonna need in the future. And I also have a very happy announcement for all of us and our viewers this evening. Uh, I'm gonna digress a little bit here. Um, board members may remember that last year, uh, the federal government suddenly opened up the possibility of federal earmarks. Uh, they hadn't done this in 10 years. And we were very excited, along with everyone else in the, in the country. And we all scrambled to throw as many proposals at our various senators and House representatives as we could. And we did that as well. After not hearing anything for a while, we had assumed simply that we had not been successful. We found out yesterday that we were. And I'm happy to let you know today that uh, Senator Gary Peters did pick up one of our earmark requests and has made available to us $300,000 to advance the planning of the Ypsilanti Transit Center. This is a small but important bit of that yellow part of the graph. And it's really important to, to be able to sort of set the pin to say we got a Senator to help us out with this. This is wonderful. So on behalf of the organization and the whole community, if the Senator is watching, thank you very much. Uh, We'll send a fruit basket. Um, but no, this is exactly how we will fill up the, the, the yellow and red sections. Earmarks are nice because it's free money. The big grants for facilities, for, for vehicles, for a lot of this other stuff, you've got you to ante up 50%, 40% of local money. So that's where uh, that, that item 10 would go. So uh, in the packet, on one of the pages in there is this table. I wanna take a moment and, and orient everyone to it. I apologize for its complexity. Uh, this is where we talk numbers. I hope, no, we can't see it. So uh, what we see here on this table uh, down the, uh, the first column are the itemized listed uh, elements, one through 10 grouped into their two uh, categories. The columns going across to the right are attempting to illustrate the costs um, the resulting mill rate of the costs and the cumulative mill rate as all of those are added up. Again, uh, the, the optional elements do not have to be taken as a package, they can be taken individually. And then there's a start date uh, there as well. So just for orientation, if we look at item one, renewal of the existing millage, uh, $5.6 million represents 26% of the total cost down at the bottom, 21.89 million. So that's what the percentage is referring to. I did get some feedback that my table was hard to understand. I apologize. Um, the mill rate in the next column on that same line 0.7, that is the 0.7 uh, 
mil uh, that we originally have. 5.7 is the mathematic result of a 0.7 mil. Uh, 0.7 is 29% of the total mill rate that you see at the bottom of that column, which adds at this point 2.38 mills. I do want to make a point, and this is something uh, that Mike caught in an earlier version of this table, and thank you, Mike, that these two numbers between the mill rate and the total cost do not add directly, and I want to be clear about why. Uh, no, they do not add. There's, there's not a direct collection between the mill rate and the total cost. The reason for that is that these different elements get different levels of other funding, and that other funding can drive down the net mill rate. We're not we're trying to strip out any other cost. So, for example, the customer service representatives at the Ypsilanti Transit Center do not generate fair revenue themselves. That's generated by the bus service. So the Ypsilanti Transit Center staff do not get any offset for fair revenue generated, whereas many of the new services do. There's also uh, the state eligibility. The federal MDOT will help us with eligible operating expenses. But that does mean that there are some operating expenses that are not eligible. Um, so uh, we had to factor those things out. And that's a significant fact. That's like 30%. So uh, that's a significant factor. So you can't directly mathematically correlate these two columns. I did want to be clear about that. And then finally, the last uh, column uh, is the start date. And this goes to the next point about the timing. I'm sure we'll come back to this table. Implementation timelines. So uh, transit takes a long lead time to get set up, uh, planned, clear regulatory, regulatory hurdles, as we discussed. Um, the new funding would begin in mid-2024. New services could start as early as August of 2024. We would use the intervening time to plan, clear regulatory hurdles, hire, you know, recruit, hire, train, uh, and get things ready to go. Some staff positions might start a little early if we can front loan those costs, but that would help us execute. Timing of the referenda. Uh, I am recommending in the proposal we consider August of 2022. Uh, the reasons for this, and I want to work backwards, um, our money will run out in 2024. The latest we can uh, ask a, a community to give us the tax money is going to be very early, I think, 2024 or late 2023. That's just how the paperwork goes. So the latest we could hold a referenda and hit that would be November of 2023. That's the drop dead date. After that, we run out of money in 2024 and we're gonna to have to make very deep service cuts most likely. So the other element to understand here is that we are only allowed by law to go to the voters once per calendar year. It's not a rolling 12 month thing, it's literally the calendar year. So 2022 makes a lot of sense because 2023 could be our backup should something not pan out. It also gives us an, a lot of time to be certain that the funding will arrive, and we can use that time uh, productively to do the planning, to do the public involvement, to sort out some of the details that some earlier commenters uh, wanted, uh, wanted to see now. All right, so that's the rationale for uh, 2022. Why August? And we kind of get to pick August or November, and I, I like to think of this as we can pick the calm or we can pick the storm. And that may be over dramatic, but bear with me. November general election, yes, higher turnout, uh, but also very loud, very hard to help uh, voters understand what they're voting on. When we look uh, at what we're going, what we can reasonably see in November, we see control of the United States House of Representatives up for grabs. We see the governorship of Michigan we see a lot of local races uh, as well. There are as many as 12 statewide ballot initiatives collecting signatures right now trying to get on the November ballot. This covers things from abortion rights, voting rights, COVID measures. These are not easy subjects. We can expect a lot of loud, acrimonious yelling, for lack of a better word, as proponents and opponents of these various factions duke it out. Uh, in doing so, they will consume uh, all of the available media, even buying a Facebook ad, uh, to let voters know that we have a ballot measure could become prohibitively expensive. 
So it's simply hard to reach voters. The ballot itself is also going to become enormous. If only half of those 12 measures get on, that's a big ballot. By comparison, the August primary election is a smaller ballot, less distractions, lower costs to help educate other voters about what they're considering. Uh, there are primaries, yes, and some important ones out there. The Republicans will be selecting one to go against uh, Governor Gresham Whitmer, so that will definitely get people's attention. But we're not aware of any other ballot measures in any of our communities. I'm sure there may be something that's coming up, but we're not aware of it. So the simple uh, calm around this election, relatively speaking, it will still be an ele American election, uh, will uh, require us, uh, will allow us to educate voters a bit more easily. So. That's, that's the proposal in a nutshell. Like I say, it maintains all services, expands and enhances with a variety of options you can choose from. It's very important to a large number of groups, but for really all of us in the community. It advances your goals and the goals of the community and helps us maximize state and federal funding. Next steps. Um, our public feedback on this millage proposal is, is, is kind of rolling in tandem with the long range plan. They were both uh, effectively released on Monday. Um, the public feedback sessions for the long range plan, we know we're going to hear about this millage, we welcome that feedback at those at those um, many meetings that you've all mentioned. We also have special email addresses and, and phone numbers for people to call and tell us what they think about this millage proposal specifically, uh, and that will run and throw uh, April the 19th. We're here this evening introducing this millage proposal to you and to the members of the community. April 5th, we have a meetings in Ypsilanti uh, with our city council and Ypsilanti Township Board of Trustees uh, already scheduled. We look forward to going there. We also have, I believe, meetings with um, the Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners. We're looking into the Ann Arbor DDA, and we would welcome opportunities from other organizations who would like us to present this information. April 21st is your next board meeting. Uh, that's important because the deadline, if you do want to go for a ballot proposal in August, there is a deadline of May 10th to get that ballot language to the Washtenaw County Clerk to get it on the ballot. We missed that deadline. We're not going in August. The, 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 the last meeting time that you have presently scheduled is your April 21st meeting. Uh, additional meetings, of course, are at your discretion, uh, but we are targeting right now Hopefully, you would be comfortable reaching a decision by April if you wanted to do August. That would become uh, very important. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you all very much for your patience. I appreciate your attention and the attention and interest and feedback that we've gotten from so many members of the community already. So with that, Mr. Chair, happy to answer any questions or clarifications from the board. Thank you, Matt. I'll open it up for any board members who want to discuss. Who wants to start? Raymond? Again, I'll just want to say thanks to staff for a very well thought out uh, detailed proposal. I think it um, does align with um, a lot of the ends that the goal that the board has established um, and, you know, keeps the agency solvent, but then also moves us in a direction that aligns with the long range plan. Um, I'm again, I'm happy to see we're being ambitious again, you won't know unless you ask so doing it now on this timeline makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and then if we miscalculated or if we just misunderstood what the Community desired in this space, we do have an opportunity to come back uh, with a second ask and, and tailor it if need be. Um, I, you know, I'd be supportive of even giving staff direction tonight to give the time to do so. Um, I don't know if that's appropriate, but it is listed as a decision item on our agenda. So I think that opens up the possibility for us to at least um, give that direction. Um, it's decision preparation, actually, at the bottom. <laughs> well, there is no other decision on our agenda. So <laughs> everything is a decision preparation then. Um, so anyway, uh, that's just kudos to the staff and I'm supportive of it. And if it's today or uh, in April, I'm happy to support it either way. Thank you. Others, Mike. Yes, I'd like to thank you very much, Matt. It was a really excellent presentation. Um, your overall setting the stage and then getting into the specifics of it 
really gave me a whole lot more understanding of what you're proposing than I had before. Uh, and I appreciate it very much. Um, you mentioned early on in the presentation about how this proposal is maximizing state and federal funding. And then you said near the end, when you were going through the details and the numbers that um, uh, you got back to that and said some of these uh, provide not only state and local funding, but some additional uh, fare box revenues. Um, I kind of, I, you know, my financial background, I kind of consider the way I would look at this is we are asking for property tax dollars that, the, that our property owners would be paying to us. And we're leveraging that to, to, uh, to get more funds from state, local, and to a lesser extent, I'm sure, from the, uh, the, fair, from the fair box. But I was hoping maybe you could go back to the listing of, of one through 10 and talk about, not, not numerically, but qualitatively where you, you see we're getting the most leverage, particularly in state and federal uh, revenues against our property tax revenues. And I, and I, I presume I, it doesn't really make any sense to do number one, because we're all, I mean, that's, we're not increasing anything. So I, I think we really want to talk about uh, how we're increasing our property taxes to, and, and getting more money than just those property tax dollars. Sure. And that's a, an expansive question. Uh, I'll try to be uh, concise and then let you drill down. I'll also ask uh, Deb if uh, perhaps Dina, our chief financial officer, if she's available, perhaps she could join uh, up as a and, panelist. And, and Matt, I'm really not asking to for you to provide the, the actual dollar numbers. I just, I just want to get a qualitative feel for it. Absolutely. And, and yeah, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to try to be a human calculator because it won't work well. Um, so, but you so Dina, Dina, I think that's not necessary. Yeah, I'm not going to call it that. Um, uh, so uh, we, we as so one of the interesting things about having a public transit agency in your community is that we put back more money into the community than we take in in property taxes. That's not always uh, recognized, but by having a transit service that you pay for uh, locally, let's say through property taxes, makes you eligible to large pots of state and federal money. The state money changes depending on where you are, but the federal money is provided uniformly across the entire country. For every dollar that the ride receives in property tax revenue, we leverage that right now and receive another dollar and 40 cents in these various um, uh, uh, state and federal uh, formulas. The formulas themselves, the grants that are involved are an exceedingly complex tangle of decades of legislative decisions. Uh, they do take a whole career to really uh, begin to, to un unwrap, unravel. The, um, the, the use of local tax funding uh, and how far we can leverage those dollars uh, often has to do with which program we apply for, whether it's operating dollars or capital dollars. So for example, uh, a lot of these services, number five, um, six, seven, eight, and nine are primarily operating expenses. There's really, there's a little bit of capital for the furniture in the YTC, but not a lot. This is staff, fuel, insurance. We do not see that we need to buy any more buses for any of this, these services, for example. So in, in, in spending money on items five through nine, uh, we would be eligible for state operating assistance to varying degrees, depending on their eligibility rules. That can run as high as 30%, which is wonderful. Um, item 10 is about large capital projects, and this is where we get into very large dollar amounts for major projects, facilities, uh, uh, technology changes, and that's completely different set of grants. And there can be uh, leverage opportunities there, again, with the federal and state government 
that can be just as lucrative, if I can use that word, as the operating grants, and sometimes even more so, because we're talking about a project that's you know, tens of millions of dollars, but is intended to last 30 years or longer. Uh, so it's, it, it's sort of judged in a, in a different way. So this millage does inherently include operating and capital. I think that's an important distinction. We have done that in our previous millages as well, but not to this degree. By freeing up um, uh, the capital funding in item 10, the federal formula funds, this creates a bit of a, a shifting that's able to happen below the waterline in our budget, where we replace those federal funds with local dollars. The federal dollars can shift back to what the feds originally intended them for, for capital. That can be used a good example, Dina and I were discussing um, all of the planning for the Ypsilanti Transit Center, for the bus rapid transit, for the garage, for the other terminals, for the zero emissions buses. All of that often can be considered a capital expense by the federal government because you're planning for that physical capital investment. Therefore, you can save your receipts from all the operating expenses and cash them in as a capital dollar and use other people's money, in this case, those federal formula funds to help pay for that. How we shift things back and forth is, is a very complex uh, game of, of, of chess uh, that Dina and her staff play. But ultimately, what we do is we try to shift the money to leverage as much as we can from outside sources. And sometimes this means shifting the local dollar over to pay for something simply because we could free up capital dollars that we can get from the feds, for example, uh, or save local dollars in our capital reserve to use in another way. So I know it's a complicated uh, answer, Mike. It's a complicated uh, uh, situation. But if you have any follow-up questions, uh, me or maybe better Dina uh, could provide a follow-up answer. Uh, thank you, Matt. I, I think that that's probably an, enough of an answer. I don't think we want to get into too too much of the minutia of the dollars here at the board meeting. Thanks, Mike. Other board members who questions about uh, the proposal? Jesse? Um, I too also just want to commend you on this. Um, and while I do have, I think, a similar amount of enthusiasm to uh, Mr. Hess, I also think we need to give the public some time to give us some feedback uh, before we vote on it. Um, I, <laughs> I wanted to, uh, I do want to call out um, item number nine. It's the smallest item on here, but it's actually one that's particularly close to me uh, in my heart um, because of all those things that you identify. There are so many things that someone from east of 23 has to go all the way into Ann Arbor for um, to get a, a week pass to, you know, to get any sort of uh, um, discount. Um, I know I yet to get a discounted fare. Um, and I think that's going to be, it's a huge, huge equity issue some, and something that we've been very acutely aware of. Um, all of these other items, you know, they're called out in the long range plan, but um, I remember a news article um, when we first started getting feedback on the YTC and one of the, uh, a lot of feedback we got was that people wanted customer service amenities at the, at the YTC, um, even more so I think at that point that they really even cared about a new building. I still think we need to build a new building, but having a customer service agent at the YTC is what makes it a true transit center. And I'm really glad to see that included in this plan. Thank you, Jesse. Ryan? Okay. Um, I guess I'll start by saying um, thank you for that presentation. And um, I know we're all in it together. So uh, thank you for all the hard work and uh, dedication and uh, time you took to give us this presentation. But with that, you know, I, I hate to be the but, but. Um, so, you know, I, I'll start by saying, um, <laughs> it's a, uh, I'll give an, an anecdote that a couple of years ago, my mother was uh, looking for a new car and I'm somewhat knowledgeable about cars. And she handed me her laptop and she said, Ryan, 
help me with the equipment on this thing. So I was like, oh, sure, I got you. So I began putting everything in place, everything she wanted, speakers, leather, everything. And then when I handed that laptop back to my mom, I said, here you go. And she looked at it and she scrolled her eyes down to that price tag and she shut that laptop and slid it right back to me in one fell swoop. So I say that to say, everything sounds good until you get the bill. And some of this proposal is somewhat concerning. And I have been dealing with a fair amount of feedback coming from um, folks in the community. And we, just to give some additional background to what I'm saying, we went to uh, the Ipsy Township board meeting a few months back, I think it was October, maybe November. And uh, in fact, Mr. Yang, I think you were with us on that occasion. And um, in that meeting, we talked about the long range plan and it was universally uh, rebounded back to us that the township was heavily against any taxation or certainly want to minimize what taxation looks like. So when I hear this plan and I hear other comments that have been made tonight, especially with regard to the long range plan, um, it's just a little concerning because you were talking about opportunity zones and opportunity zones are, you know, sprinkled throughout the Ipsy and Ipsy Township community. And that's reflective of the need of the community. And it's a community that's been very hard hit repeatedly over the last 10 years or so. Probably even before that, probably going back to when Ford pulled out st pulled stakes out back in the 90s. This econ the, the economy in that community, in this community, have not fully rebounded. So when I hear these plans, the tax rate or the tax increases are going to be well over 300% for some folk. And in a time where we're looking to bring things back, we're coming out of a pandemic. Some might say that pandemic isn't over. And we're looking at Russia and who knows what's gonna happen there. So I think I wanna encourage that we take a long, hard pause before plowing ahead. I think that the plan to switch the community into more uh, sustainable resources is excellent. I commend you all on that uh, ambition. But we have to think about what that's going to mean in terms of dollars and cents for the everyday person. And when you want to bring folks into the community as workers, quote, you got to think what that worker has in terms of their means. So these are things that we just need to keep in mind in moving forward. I don't want to be the person that shuts everything down. I don't want to douse water and I don't want to be a cloud in the sky, but I got to be real. And this is real. So, um, few things I'd like to say from here, I guess, because as you've been talking, I've just been jotting notes. Okay. So um, you said that we have two years to kind of get active with things before we begin looking at um, uh, problems, just to kind of make it short. You know, so we have one shot at it this year, but then we also have a shot at it next year. I think it might be advantageous for us to allow the economy to recover perhaps before we even make a move. Uh, because so many things are still up in the air and before we lock the community into a rate that they might not be able to afford, let's just see what the economy will do before we spring that on folks. So, you know, I want that to be out there in, in everyone's ether. And also, I would also add to that, um, that um, in addition to that, um, oh, what was I gonna say there? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, if nothing else, April, I think is, 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 or August rather, is rather soon. And I think if we go in maybe November, we're looking, I know what you said about the ballot and that ballot's gonna be lengthy and it's gonna have a number of issues. And by the time and people get ballot exhaustion, I understand that, uh, but that allows for a further, more robust, ro robust conversation across the entire community where more information can become known. And then we can get, I think, a more thorough feedback as if this is something that people have the appetite for at this moment. So I think there's many alternatives that we can begin focusing in on and allowing for. And just before we jump, because we can, we should think if we should. So um, I know that's a lot to offer up in this quick snapshot, 
but these are meaningful things. And I would invite anyone here who's in question of any of what I'm saying, just to take a ride through the community. We're talking about West Willow. We're talking about areas where folks don't really have, you know, they're having to decide between if they wanna uh, fix their windows on their house or get dinner. So these are real concerns that everyday folks are, are facing out there that maybe isn't happening as much west of uh, 23. And I don't even like saying that. That to me just sounds like the Berlin Wall. But you know, these are realities. So um, with that, maybe I'll pause here, uh, let, let you have a chance to respond to me, or let others, you know, jump in for dialogue. Uh, but that's just what I wanted to say. So thank you. Thank you. Other board members or Kathleen? So I greatly appreciate what Mr. Hunter just shared. I do have um, my own concerns about the mill rate. And I'm wondering, I seem to remember if it was last month or the month before where there was a more comprehensive um, laying out of what happens if we don't go at this mill rate, but we go at say 1.6. Um, and I'm wondering if there's a way to please uh, get those numbers back to the board so that we can have more information to make the decision. I uh, completely empathize uh, with, um, you know, just because somebody lives in Ann Arbor doesn't mean that they have the means either. Um, so I'm thinking about my low income uh, brothers and sisters who out there who also live in Ann Arbor that itself, but also Ipsy and Ipsy Township. And I think that the board needs, I'm very pleased that the public had a 72% rate in terms of saying, let's go for number four. And I appreciate that we need to lay the foundation for the, the long range plan. And I appreciate that there are so many things that we want to do because the public is saying we want these expansions, we want greater hours overnight, we want greater uh, accessibility on the weekends, and we need this and that and the other thing. But I also think that we need to be aware of what's happening in our world in terms of number one gas prices, we just talked about that, and how it is hitting everyone's so hard, it's raising food prices and people are making decisions like what Mr. Hunter said of, do I fix the window on my house or do I buy food for my family? You know, do I put that one gallon of gas in or do I go to my daughter's, you know, recital or whatever it is. I mean, there are so many hard choices that are being made and I want us to be prudent and good stewards to all of our community and have all the information available so that while I love the 2.3, I look at that and I think, oh, yes, everything. But my heart also says everything may not be able to happen right now. And so what would be our alternative plan? So I would like more information to look at that. I agree. I understand that my voice is only one voice. It's not the board's voice. but is that possible to please have more information to look at other alternatives? Any other board members first, Susan? Just um, to my fellow board members, as we are anticipating coming back for discussion in April, uh, the menu that we have in front of us, which includes the first four items are to sustain the millage that we first approved as a community in 2014 with an adjustment for inflation and so forth. What we heard was we have to find a way to re either renew the millage or expand the millage. Uh, so I think that may be something we discuss at the next meeting, is that a given? Because I don't know that it is, but I'm sort of laying that out. Is that or is that not a given? And then on the other items below in sensitivity to the issues that you're raising about community members and their ability to spend more in tax dollars, I think it would be helpful to me as we get to the discussion in April, which items should we take off the list? I think staff have done a really good job outlining the estimated costs for each thing. And so do we look at the longer hours of service and say, you know, we can't afford that as much as we need it? Or is it the funding for future capital and having dollars to match those future grants? Is that the thing we take off the table? But I would challenge us as a board 
to look at those lists and peel off the pieces that we feel we just can't afford at this point and why. I think that is where we are as a board first to discuss whether it's a given about the 2014 millage and the adjustments and then two within the second batch the service enhancement options. I know I would benefit from hearing your thoughts. What are the essentials? What are not the essentials? I know I would benefit from hearing your thoughts on those. Thank you. And again, that's April. So we, have, we don't have to do that tonight. I wanna give everybody a chance to speak once before anybody else speaks twice. So, Rich. Um, I just want to, um say that i mean the presentation that matt gave us was actually i think our direction i can't remember if we had this discussion in committee or at a prior board meeting talk because i think he did like like you said like he presented us different options of how we could present this to the public um so i'm actually glad that we're having this discussion but i just want to make sure that we as a board remember that because it's actually us that are directing matt to present this information so we should have these deep discussions and i'm glad that we are um, especially factoring in the commentary that we've heard from the public that you've been hearing also directly, and I know Jesse has also, and I'm sure the staff has been getting that feedback too. But um, like you said, uh, it's, it's really up to us if I'm over the process correctly. Um, so let's definitely have a discussion, whether it's today, which I think might be something we have to consider, because I mean, if we do decide that we want to get into that, um, we have to meet that May deadline, and we only have one more board meeting. I don't know if we're going to be able to get through that all even at the next meeting so maybe that's something for us to consider is like do we get into these deeper discussions today or do we postpone it to the next board meeting or do we push it off to committees but if it was i can't remember if we did it in the finance committee where we talked about how to present um the the potential millage you know whether it's this big chunk of two point something or reduce it down um but if we do it in a committee then we're only hearing certain voices. And I think that maybe what we're kind of seeing tonight is that there was a bunch of discussion that happened that didn't have everyone discussing. So I would be eager for us to try and do that now, then revert it back to committee and also push it to April. That's just my thoughts. Yeah, no, I think Tonight's discussion is for that deep discussion. We, I think we should be, we have all the information we need right here to Kathleen's question. And I think Susan answered it. The table has what we need. I mean, the first four items here are just to renew. One point, if you add up the 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.13, 0 0.09, that adds up to 1.52. That's just to maintain, that's just to hold serve. The other stuff that adds up to 2.38 are the service enhancements. Uh, I mean, I would like to point out, I mean, yes, you know, we, we, we've, you know, Matt pointed out in his feedback or in his presentation, over 1,400 contacts have been made. People have responded, over 1,400 people have responded to this from all communities at all different levels, income levels, who have responded to this. And three quarters of them said, we want transformational change. Okay. So, I mean, are there going to be some people who, uh, don't want this of course they're going to be but overwhelmingly the people who have responded have responded with be bold and so if we go against that be aware we're going to be going against the overwhelming will of the people who have responded so if you want to just say no no no, no let's not do it you're going to be going against 72 percent of the people who said go big okay so if you want to cut back and say nope can't do it um i i understand that but just understand the ramifications of that are you going against three quarters of the people who have responded and responded go big uh also uh i mean i guess i want to commend matt for all of the hard work to lay out not just the rate but the dollars associated with the rates what's going into that i've been on the board i think longer than anybody here and i have never once had anybody come in here and say you know what we don't need more service you know, we, we need less of, less weekend service. We need less overnight service. We need less service period. You guys do too damn much for the community. I've never heard that in, in the nine years I've been on the board almost. So all of these things, and what I especially commend the staff for is all of these service enhancements we have heard repeatedly over and over again through contacts with staff, contacts at our meetings, 
uh, in the community ourselves, the people we represent. I, I know I've heard it. When am I going to get more service here? When am I going to get more service on Sunday? When am I going to get this? We've all heard that. I've never heard anybody say, don't do any more. You guys do too much. Okay, so all of these have been brought up to the staff, I think, frequently. And that's why they're on here. Uh, yes, is inflation a monster right now? It is, but inflation never lasts forever. Uh, is Vladimir Putin <laughs> killing us right now? He is, but Vladimir Putin's not going to last forever. Okay, one way or another, he's you know this Russian crisis is going to last forever. Am I sensitive to the fuel shortage supply? Of course I am. Uh, but just remember that we are not right now passing that cost off to the customers. Our fares have remained steady, so they're not taking it in the wallet to to ride our service the way if you ride a car you're taking it in the wallet okay so that is holding steady it's not impacting them i like everything i see on here i think we've gotten a mandate from the community to be bold be brave and be transformational and now's not the time to be soft about it not it's not the time to be shy about it uh, i like the ambition and i like the aggression to do it and quite frankly if the public says, nope, that's too ambitious. As we said, we get, we have another shot at it to go lower next time. But it's a heck of a lot easier to go big, come up short, and then go lower than it is to go lower and say, eh, dang it, we left money on the table. Because I will tell you that, Matt knows this from 2018. My first thing, I called Matt as soon as we won by 84% of the vote. And I said, you realize how much money we left on the table by just doing a renewal. Uh, I, I sang that song for about a year to Matt uh, when we were here. We left a heck of a lot of money on the table because we held it steady, passed at a high rate, and everybody said we loved it. And I said, if we could have gotten 0.7 mils at 84%, we could have gotten 1.2 mils at 64% or something like that. So we left a lot of, I don't want to make that mistake again. And the, yes, the conditions are bad right now, but I promise you two years from now, three years from now, when they start seeing these service improvements, nobody's going to think about the Russian-Ukrainian crisis or the inflation back in 2022. They're going to think about the BRT light that they're enjoying right now. All right, so, you know, are we going to, yes, things are a little scary right now, but are we going to be happy with the decision one week from now, one month from now, one year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, are we going to be happy with the decision we made? It's time to have a little forward thinking and a little backward thinking uh, and be the visionaries that we are put on this board to be. That's what I'll, that's my comment about it. Any others? Jesse? A little less excited about it now, but um, to the people, I'm a little less excited about talking now. Um, but I mean, I've heard the same things that you've heard. Um, and, you know, I look and, you know, 2.38 mils is a, that's a pretty hefty increase. That's, you know, three times as, as much as we, as we were levying before. You know, my, my house is probably pretty close to $100,000 $100, assessed value. So I'm looking at that much, you know, $66, you know, well, I'll, I'll take the township number of $76 per annually per mill. It's like $180, $180 extra per year. And that's not even one month of a car payment. That's what we're talking about. We are talking about freedom from car dependency. And that is worth so much money so much more money than the annual increase in the tax on a house. We're talking about people being able to get from work home at three o'clock in the morning, and they can't do that any now. They can't do that in Ypsilanti Township. $180 for one year and someone gets, to get, someone gets to go home and get a good night's sleep. Someone gets to take a job without worrying about how they're going to get there. I'll pay it. So. Others? Any questions on the implementation, the service, anything else within the report itself? I just have a question. When we meet again in April, will we have a draft of the millage language to also consider? Uh, that was the intent. Um, 
based on your feedback today, I'm not sure uh, exactly what that language would be. I can I can sense the, uh, the, the, the uncertainty in some respects. So uh, we would probably be providing language general enough to be edited by you. We'd probably ask Dykema to be here uh, if you want to hit the August uh, uh, thing. So if necessary, we could edit it on the fly. <clears throat> so a uh, couple of things I want to just kind of respond to in no particular order. Um, I want to say that I wasn't meaning to imply that folks uh, west of 94 don't have hardships. Absolutely, they do. I know that for a fact. So I, I don't want to make um, these things mutually exclusive. You know, both communities have folks who are at this point in time struggling. So that's the first thing I want to say. Um, second thing I want to say is of the 1,400 respondents that we got, the thing that I, I, this is like, for me, this is like the 800 pound elephant that's not even being mentioned. And I want to respect um, folks who responded. Um, but my question is, how do we get these respondents? Were these folks that responded to phone calls? Were these folks that left messages online? And what, what, you know, what have you? I'm assuming that's the way that these things happened. Uh, and I, and I'll, do you want to speak to that real quick? Or do you want to, can, can I get can I, I think he did speak to it, but maybe you can reiterate what you said before. In terms of the, the reach out and where these 1400 contacts to Ryan's right. question, where they came from. Certainly. So I think to Mr. Hunter's question, um, on most of the public involvement here as a result of people who voluntarily chose to reach out and make their opinion known into the process. So uh, we did do a, a random telephone survey uh for for mobile and landlines as well that did touch a representative sample of everyone but otherwise yes uh, the people who responded to the public came to the public meetings who filled out the online surveys um the people in this photo are the people who cared enough about this issue to make the time to come in and provide us that their input so thank you so that's that's kind of what i'm getting at right right there is we have a large swath of people in in East 94 or East 23 rather um, that uh, don't even have those resources. So the the pool that you're getting responses from is kind of a select pool. There's so many people out there. You know, I've worked for nonprofits in the community that their sole mission is just handing out a laptop to a kid because their family have no resources. And with the pandemic, the kids were getting left behind because their family could not provide them with the basic resources that we are taking for total granted at this moment. You know, yeah, it's great to be able to have a cell phone so you can call and give a response, or it's great to have a laptop so you can email something to someone. But there's a lot of people who don't even have that. So I don't even think, and this is my own biased response, but I don't even think it's fair to say that the people that we need to talk to, we've even reached. So I just want to throw that out there and also to to something Jesse said, you know, I think you said something at $180. You know, yeah, I understand that that's something that a lot of people are willing to pay. Is that something everyone can pay? Less than one month of a car payment. $100, $180 over an entire year is less than one month of a car payment. By not doing this, you are condemning those same people you're talking about to pay $200 every single month for an entire year. And that's for a pretty dang cheap car. So yeah, I think people might rather pay $180 a year to not have to spend two, three thousand dollars in a year. I'll, I mean, that's that's what we're talking about. We're talking about not needing to own a car, not needing to buy gas. And if you've got a counter argument to that, tell me how $180 is uh, more expensive than two thousand. Rich? Uh, yeah, so um, this discussion is, is not something that's uncommon, even at like whatever level it is, or it's local, CUNY, statewide, right? And I think there's two things that I wanted to maybe just talk about. One is, I think it's showing that there is there needs to be education around how millage exactly works. Like even me, like I've, I've gone to college, all this stuff, every time millage comes up, my head's going like, 
how the hell do I calculate this? Like, how does this work with my property value, this kind of stuff? And in these communities that Ryan is talking about, I mean, one, they're not typically getting information through traditional methods. Like I get most of my stuff through the internet, but like Ryan said, there's a lot of folks here that don't even have computers or little methods to be able to get that information. Um, but that education piece, I think will also enable them and maybe a large number of people that called are just because they just don't understand. Like you just hear word mills and tax and that makes a lot of people's just heart rate go crazy. And like you have a point too, right? It's, it's $180, but there's also this thing like they call about the poor tax, right? So a percentage, for say like me at say like uh, just 1% tax is really not much for me, but someone that doesn't have a lot of income, that 1% is actually a huge portion of their actual salary. And so that kind of balance is really to kind of figure out, and just so you understand, right? And like, like cars, but I don't know how many percentage of those people that like Ryan represents and he's talking with actually gonna have the ability to own a car. So $2,000 versus $180, yeah, I mean, that's, I, I definitely see that savings, but for those people, $180 is like, you know, putting food on the table. So I'm, all I'm just saying is like, what we're talking about, it's been a discussion forever and we just have to figure out that balance. And I understand, like I'm a big proponent and supportive of this, um, but there are communities that this will be a hardship. We just have to, um, be aware of that and this goes to some discussions i brought up in prior board meetings of just like how do we better support those that are really highly dependent on our service but they can't afford it even even the race that we had right last board meeting i talked about the gold ride uh and the cost for that and those older adults and and, and the folks that are physically challenged like they're getting double dinged uh with expensive service that we have but we also have a budget to meet and we have services to provide and equipment to, to take care of um, and so I, I just ask that we just figure out the balance. It's not going to make everyone happy. I definitely love the passion for both. And, pre, and I know the communities are, are, are really happy, Ryan, that you are making sure that we remember them. I mean, that's very easy to forget the folks on the east side. And just I know you live there. Right? You, you face these challenges all the time, especially like the, <laughs> the, the um, service level in regards to like scheduling that you have to deal with to get, to get around. So um, I, I, I'm just saying I hear both of you, um, but I'm a big fan of let's, yeah, let's get this, uh, figure this out and figure out a solution. Anybody else? Jesse, go ahead. Thank you. It's in our ends that one of our primary goals is to enable people to live without a car. That's it's in our end statements, the, the core thing that we are working for. And this represents, we spent years on this long range plan. Pre COVID, this work started. There, there, were, there are but ridership surveys, surveys that were actually taken on the bus that said the exact same thing that people want. If I'm going to go down the list, you know, they want reduced travel times between Ann Arbor and its landing. They want longer hours of operation system wide. They want increased frequency, not just on weekends, but that's what we're covering. Like, I want more than all this, and our riders want more. And this is the first step of our long range plan. And if we can't even do this, then I don't even really understand why we're here. I understand there are people here who don't want to pay taxes to fund buses, but I don't think that's the majority of the people we have seen data, impartial data that indicates that, that's, that we are a popular service. 80% went to our millage renewal. So I like, this is what enables people to live without a car and we can't even if we're if we're going to be starting to pick away at that then we are not actually achieving our own ends and if we're not working towards our ends then we shouldn't be here and just let me add something i mean jesse mentioned 180 dollars that that's a single home property owner right that we're talking about right so we're talking about property owners themselves the reason we're not taxing the riders is that we're spreading this over the entire votership of our community 
right? So we're not taxing the riders and putting the burden on them. They're not making the choice between $180 and $2,000 a year. We are making the choice to say, hey, we're going to pay $180 or whatever the, you know, less than one car month payment is going to be for the benefit of the people so they don't have to pay the $2,000 a year. Now, you might say, well, you know, the property owners are going to, you know, for the people who don't own property, they rent and the rent might go up. And maybe that might be the case. I don't know. Uh, and if that is the case, that somebody would take a $180 tax increase and gouge their renters for that amount of money so they come out net zero or come out ahead, then shame on them. But that's still no reason we say, yeah, our, our riders might get gouged, so we're going to hold back or not give the service we need. I, I, I think that would be a cheap way out, personally. Um, so I, I just want to be clear. We're, we seem to be conflating the 2000 with 180 et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's not a kind of one for one trade off that we're talking about. We're talking about spreading the cost over the entire area, most of whom are going to be bus riders, but are going to be property owners who have cars and can drive them who are still willing to pay this according to our data and all the data points, the overwhelming majority of whom are still willing to pay it. You know, my you know, I, I know lots of elderly people who still are very mobile and active, who have friends who are still willing to say, hey, I'm willing to pay more so that my senior citizen friends who live next door can get where they need to go, et cetera. So, you know, I, I just don't want to conflate the the example that Jesse gave earlier with, you know, the $2,000. It, it gets too easy to start mixing these numbers together. So, you know, there is a there is a distinction. We're not taxing the riders. And like I said, our fares have remained steady for years now we haven't increased those so they're not getting in the wallet with this it's it's the property owners the people sitting around here who are going to get hit with it right i mean that's that's those are the people and to jesse's point he's willing to pay it and i think most of the people that we've talked to agree with him go ahead Ryan. thank you so two things uh i just trickle down you know when i when i hear that i i know what you're saying but i i just can't help but think that those costs will eventually be passed down you know i know that it's property owners but at the end of the day those costs are going to somehow end up i'm afraid being palmed off into those who are inhabiting the actual properties that are being taxed so that's just the way i see it and i don't believe there's anything that's going to sway me from that um so that's one and two you know i'm not saying jesse that this isn't something that we cannot do. I'm not saying that. I know that there, first off, there's a few things here. There's a few options we can we can look at. It's not one or none. It's, there's something that we can probably look at in between. And um, so, Rich, thank you for saying that. I, I appreciate your comments there. Um, but, you know, we're talking about folks who need help and, you know, Willow Run is not even gonna get built up for another 10 years, according to these plans. So these are folks that are not gonna feel a difference tomorrow. So why do we have to rush into this thing headlong right now? That's all I'm saying, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Other board members? Kathleen? So for me, listening to all the dialogue that is going on right now, I wanna say I'm very appreciative of all the passion and the thoughts that have been shared, because I think this is exactly what needs to be done on our level to make the best decision possible for the public and their needs. And by having all of these passionate conversations, it's allowing us to dig deeper and to make a more, to me, a more meaningful decision than this is what was presented by staff and us I don't think we ever just rubber stamp anything. I think I know all of us well enough to say that we are all very considerate people and thoughtful in our duties. But I just think that it is so important that these dialogues are there for the public to see that their interests are truly being served by everyone, that we're trying to think about every situation, every scenario, every customer, um, by having these engaging, thoughtful, passionate conversations. So with that, I just, I wanna say thank you. Maybe I didn't come across with that earlier when I talked to you, Mr. Carpenter, but I do truly appreciate all the hard work that went into this proposal. Um, and 
the fact that it ties into the long range plan. I also see where I'm looking at these services and some of the people that are going to be a benefit greatly from this are the very people that we're talking about now saying that may not be able to afford it. You know, we're looking at expanding services in Ipsy Ipsy Township. We're looking at longer hours of operation across the system and all of that. And so by those very things, while it may seem daunting to look at a 2.38 mil rate, there are greater strides being made in those areas that need the help. So that, that's the balance that we must achieve. We must achieve the balance of doing the greatest good for the greater part of, uh, of our community. So I am so very proud to serve on this board and I just wanna thank all of you for the thoughts that you've planted in my brain to think about until next April. Thank you. Add anything to close, or I'm sorry, Jesse, do you want one more thing? It sounds like, I guess I don't feel like we've given staff any clear direction about what to have prepared. So I would like to put forward the question to people who are saying that there's some compromise to be had here. What service do you want to cut? What service should we not provide to people on this list? Because I question. want every single one of these and that's what I would direct staff to do. There are some people saying, well, maybe we don't need to do that. Staff needs to hear from us what what should they what are we not doing Kathleen. So to answer your question after listening to everything tonight, knowing that if we go out for a millage in either August or November, no matter what we decide uh, if it fails, we can go back out next April uh, with a lower millage, and I think that. Given everything that i've heard tonight, while I am a little hesitant i also see mr um mr Mahler's point and i think that it would be best to um to look at the 2.38 and if it fails then we could go out for a lower rate i don't know how we can cut this list without affecting so many people but i all that's just my struggle with everything that's happened here tonight. I see everyone's point of view, but I also like the idea if we go out for the bigger amount and it fails, we have a second chance to, the pub, then the public has spoken and they've said, no, you asked too much. We cannot do this. And then we can go back with a more thoughtful approach, have more time and go back out next May. But I'm, I'm not a numbers person, but that's just my thoughts based on everything that's happened here tonight. Others? So uh, for my part, I would like staff to come back next month with a proposal that looks just like this. Because what I heard was we could then as a group edit it. Uh, that's why I was asking about the millage. We could edit the date, we could edit the amount, we could edit the millage language. Uh, my, my thinking is this is a great place to start. I'm, I'm a believer also in go big because I think the value returned, uh, you know, I'm one of those people on a fixed income now I know exactly what you're saying. There is a there is a pain, but we've set goals as a community. And I think this speaks to what we've said, which is we want to be able to give people more options than having to rely on a car. We know that the planet is burning. We've forgotten all about that because now we're focusing on Ukraine, but the planet is burning. And we have to find a way to change our behaviors, get more of us on the bus. And to do that, you can't have hourly service. We've got to be able to have night ride expand beyond just you know getting into ipsy but actually all of ipsy township and we have to find a way to meet the goals we've given ourselves and it means reprioritizing our dollars so i'd like to come back with exactly what we see here and then as a board let's work together to either edit it down or change the date or change the millage language as a group then we have something we can all work from but I'm resonating with 1400 participants. That's a very large number of people that made time to give us input. And I want to value that. I want to respect that. And I don't want to just set it aside saying, I, I, I think other people may not have participated. I think 1400 people did participate. And we should start from that as our beginning point. Yeah, I think that's the intent to have some this we can pick and choose we can leave it as it is we exactly. can pick august we can pick november that's that's the work that we will have to do next week and and that'll be based on 
our deliberation and of course you know what we hear from the the, the feedback of the public directly mike go ahead if if we are contemplating uh potentially cutting this to some degree um the one area i think it's pretty easy for us to understand things like night ride and um other things like express service between Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor and so forth. The one thing that is really hard to get our head, at least for me to get my head around, and I think Matt would agree, is the is number 10, which is also one of the biggest items. There's some way that Matt and his staff could try to try to tr describe to the board what it would mean to leave out that four tenths of a mill to cut that back to two tenths of a mill to you know to slice and dice that in some more of a way that we could understand uh, that would be I think that would be very helpful it's really it is easy to understand pretty easy you know overnight service and other customer ser service at Ipsy transit center and, and various things like that but that one is really hard to get our arms, heads around. I might also mention that all the people who I know and who know that I'm on the board here and know this discussion tonight is going to be about millage, I'm hearing a lot of people saying uh, that they just think that's astoundingly high. Now, what that really means, I don't know. I think a lot of them would vote for it, but they think that their other person isn't going to vote for it. Um, I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to uh, try to evaluate that, but there is, there is a lot of skepticism in people who are talking to me about going for this high a mill rate. And if we do want to consider perhaps scaling it back, um, I, I would like to know a little bit more about that last item. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess before we say, oh, we got to scale back because we're afraid of some negative feedback that maybe we have all gotten. Have we done enough to educate the public about what they're getting for this 2.38? I don't think we have. I mean, I, I don't know about the people you talk to, Mike, but they see a number and they see sticker shock and they go, oh, my God, that seems high. Yeah, I'll vote for it, but I don't know if my neighbor down the street will. Um, have we done enough to educate those people about the value they're getting? And to Jesse's point, are you... You know, uh, I, I know the kind of circles Mike Alame runs in, you know, they're, they're, they're way above me, but I mean, you know, are you and, and the people you know, are they willing to pay, to Jesse's point, $180 a year to make sure that the people who need it most can have the labor mobility that they need to live independently in this area, which is becoming, you know, as some people will tell you, more and more economically segregated each and every year. Right, so are we willing to pay, those of us who have the means to do so, are we willing to kick in and do that? I like to think and hope that Ann Arbor and this community is the type of community that will do that. In the past, they have been. And I, I frankly wouldn't be in this community if I didn't think that was the kind of community that would support that. I mean, that was one of our things for the RTA. I had this discussion when the RTA millage was up with a, a colleague of mine at my at my office who made a heck of a lot more money than I did. And he said, oh, my taxes are going up, da, 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 da. And I said at the time we had Jack Bernard on our board. And I said, right now I have somebody on my board who is legally blind and cannot leave Washtenaw County on his own. Is it worth $500 a year to you more to make sure that he and everybody else who can't get outside of this county have the means to do so? The thousands and thousands of people who can do that can get around. Is that worth $500 to you, which is less than a country club afternoon for you? And he said, well, since you put it that way, sure. So it's a matter of making sure that people understand the value and the right message and the right what kind of community do we want to live in, rather than just say, oh, my God, that seems like a lot of money to me. Um, that's where the work of our campaign and our message has to get out there about what we are doing with this money. We all know and we can see and, and let's you know be cognizant of the fact that we have built up a lot of trust in the community. People trust us with service and they trust us with their money and they approve of the job we're doing, at least you know, as of four years ago they did, and I still think they do. But you know, aside from the all right, we're gonna get some sticker shock negative reaction at first, maybe in some 
quarters, but let's ride that out and have the long-term vision to say, all right, we're going to get through that first phase. And then it's the real work of educating the public is going to happen. And by the time we get to a millage vote, whenever that is, we feel like we're going to be in good shape so that the public understands and they're going to see the value of this 2.3a for what it is. Okay, so let's let's not let's not have an overreaction to the pow at first, the initial, you know, hit the cold water in the face of the 2.38. Yeah, and I mean it is kind of it's a big jump from where we were, but that's going to pass over and then the work of the dialogue is going to begin. So I mean let's let's make sure we ride that out. Yeah, Eric, of course we, we do need to do the education. We haven't had the opportunity to do that yet. This proposal just came out. And so we really do need to do a good job of education. And I think a lot of the people that have been talking to me, once they do know more about it, will feel better. They've got to, because it makes a lot of sense. But the education, as you said, is very important. Ryan and then Susan and then we'll close it off. Uh, so I'll, you know, I don't want to belabor. I know we have other things to get to, but I, I'll just say that, you know, I don't even know if we're in a 24 hour world again yet. So, you know, the, this, this idea that folks are going to be just bustling on these buses overnight, all night, every day. To me, I just don't know if I see that at this moment. And I'll just say, if it's going to pass, it's going to pass. So what I'm saying is almost, if it passes, they're relevant, but there's nothing wrong in waiting and giving this time, giving it all the time possible for further discussion, education, and let folks go into that booth empowered. So uh, I just don't like the idea of this being rushed right now. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Susan. Thank you. Mine's just a brief request. As we examine the capital set aside, could you also bring to us uh, something that you said earlier was meaningful to me, which is the dollars then leverage other dollars. So if we go from uh, 3.2 million a year downward as a way to save dollars at the millage rate, what kind of potential would we be losing in a grant if we didn't have that money to leverage? Because uh, again, I'm thinking of the Ipsy Transit Center, I'll use that as a specific example. We're going to need X amount in our pocket to leverage. What does it mean if we reduce that amount? I think to, to Mike's point, we don't understand it. And for me, one of the pieces is what is it bringing to us from outside our community, state and federal grants? Uh, that would help me. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, if there's some kind of quantifiable multiplier, I think is what you're talking about, that we can say, hey, this is this is what it's worth to us. Every dollar we reserve for matching funds or whatever results in this or could result in that, um, if there's a way to quantify that. Any closing thoughts, Matt, before we uh, move on to, I think, audit discussion, audit report? Yes, <clears throat> I wanna thank the board. This is exactly the sort of, of TUS discussion uh, that needs to happen. I want to thank all of them, all of you, uh, for the forthrightness. I think Rich said it well. Um, this is not an uncommon spot uh, for bodies like yourselves to be in, having to <clears throat> find the right balance between the benefit that we can provide in the community and at the cost. And the cost is, is, is a real thing. I'm very proud of uh, my staff. I want to share some appreciation with them for helping to pull this together. Uh, we wanted to make sure you guys could see plainly uh, what these various initiatives could do and frankly, the expense that they incur. Uh, based on your discussion tonight, I think we did that. I was very happy to get out of the way and let you uh, have that conversation. So <clears throat> in terms of follow-ups and process, um, uh, Mike has asked for some clarity about just uh, sorting through number 10. What does it mean? How does it work? Uh, we'll do that and the impacts of changing that one. And he did raise the point of not just eliminating it or taking it entirely, but what if it was half of what it is? That one, to be clear, can be scaled up or down uh, uh, very easily, uh, unlike some of the other ones. Uh, half a bus isn't whole bus, but this one is fungible and you can move that needle very precisely. Um, <clears throat> Susan's asked for 
uh, sort of the, the multiplier impact, the leveraged dollars. And yes, I do believe we can give you some information uh, on that. Um, I do have an eye on the deadlines. It's something I've explained to you and I will just reiterate here. Right now we have one board meeting in April to discuss this at your discretion, that entire meeting could be dedicated to this one if you saw fit. Um, we do have some latitude after that, uh, before a May 10th uh, deadline to get uh, stuff to the clerk, but just to be clear on the back end, um, the way that works is you would vote after your discussion on a particular ballot language. The ballot language will be very legally worded to encapsulate your decision and the mill rate you've chosen. Uh, it will be written by our corporate counsel so that when we take it to the county clerk, there's a really good chance the clerk will look at it, say, yes, this meets all the legal requirements to be on a ballot, and checks the box, and it goes in the first time. Um, there's always a chance that the county clerk could look at it and say, your language is deficient somehow. So I want to leave a little bit of room on the back end if, if, if something were to happen with that ballot language, I don't think it will, that if you do want to go in August, we do have the ability to preserve that option. Uh, it does sound like you have a discussion ahead of you about August versus November 22 versus 23. And again, I think we've done our job on the staff side by helping you uh, recognize the importance of that conversation. So thank you for these comments. And I think the next few weeks and the feedback we all get will be very important. Thank you. Rich. I was just going to maybe make a suggestion. I don't even know if this is even allowed, but would it be worthwhile to just do like a straw poll? Because I mean, if we only have like one we, more board, we don't want to go on the record with that. Oh, we can't. Uh -huh. I mean, it's no such thing as a straw poll. Ah. We're, we're at an open meeting. Um, <laughs> okay. I mean, we can have more discussion about August versus November. I don't think we've dove in, you know, dived into, we've dived into the numbers a little bit and our feelings about that. We haven't talked about August versus November right now. I mean, a little bit, but, um, you know, to Matt's point, um, but I, I, won't, I don't want to do a straw poll now. We're on the record. Raymond? Okay. I do. I want to hear from you, Raymond. All right. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, a decision tomorrow is always in a easier than a decision today. Um, and so, the world is ever changing. There are always going to be situations um, and conflict and number of things that could influence us um, and both positively and negatively. Um, my crystal ball does not work very well. Uh, I've learned that a lot lately. So, you know, for the reasons that Matt has suggested and other ones from my perspective, I see August as very advantageous to November. Um, Yes, it's sooner. That puts you know more work on getting the message out. Um, you know, quite frankly, if you're hoping it doesn't pass, I would think you would actually support August because it's less time to prepare. But um, I, I just think having a decision in August is advantageous. I think, again, you know, we are not voting on a millage as a board. We are voting on what to put on the ballot and then the voters decide. So ultimately, it's up to the voters. Um, we're just enabling that vote to happen. Um, and I think doing so in August is the way to go. I think just November is gonna be complicated. Um, and I don't see a lot of advantages to postponing uh, from August to November, or I see a lot of disadvantages to postponing to next year. Um, We've all agreed and we've said it time and time again about the need to enhance service and all the things that have been stated. If we're not willing to kind of move in that direction, then, you know, not only, I think Jesse said, what are we doing here? We should not then even in, in good faith, even advance the long range plan. 
because we can't have a vision that's disconnected from the reality of how we're going to see that vision become reality. So um, yeah, so that's my opening uh, argument for why I think we should stick with staff's proposal for August. Anybody else? Susan? I support that uh, doubly uh, because again, I, I am really frightened of November and I was a part of the RTA vote in 20, what was that 2016? And frighteningly, we heard after the vote, quite a few of the student districts, uh, student precincts around EMU and, and U of M never turned the ballot over. They only voted the front of the ballot because they were told you need to show up. So they showed up and they voted for the presidential side. They didn't realize there were initiatives on the back. And I think the same noise, maybe not presidential, but it's gubernatorial. We may lose people who may not know to turn the ballot over. I mean, we, we isn't that dumb? But no, it's not dumb. If you've only been voting for a little while, you don't necessarily know that there's more on the back. So I think going in August, I think is the right way to go. I think there's less, there's more time for people to think about what's on there. And I am too frightened about waiting till 2023. That's essential service. We, we have to keep it going. We have to go to the voters. If we can only go once in a calendar year, it's either August or November, or we risk losing the whole thing by waiting to 2023. So I'm I'm committedly going to my mind, I, I would strongly vote when it comes to a vote, I'm gonna vote for August. Others. Okay. Yeah, I'll say one last thing. Um Go ahead, Ryan. Thank you. I don't understand why everyone is hesitant or nervous about if if it's November versus if it's August. In November, you're going to have a bigger turnout. Period. You're just going to hear from more of the people. So if this if this is a lock, that it will just be the pie will be in my face. You can all put that on the cake and I'll eat it. <laughs> when November comes around, this thing passes. Should it pass? Uh, I think if folks, not everyone's going to show up in August. We know that's true. That's true. All right. So I just think that holding out uh, a few more months, allowing further conversation in the community, getting more outreach, maybe throwing a few ads up wherever. I mean, you you can incre increase awareness and really get a full feedback effect. So that's just what I'm in favor of. But I feel like I'm right now rolling a ball uphill. So no, your opinion is important and we want to hear it. I want to hear from you too, Ryan. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Jesse? I actually really like going in August because this is a local election. And, you know, we happen to have, you know, in Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti, they've got partisan primaries. And so because they both tend to go very heavily Democratic, they're electing their leaders in the primary. This is an opportunity to have this as a topic at, you know, the candidate forums. You know, the mayor of Ypsilanti will be elected this August, functionally speaking and Ann Arbor City Council will be elected this August, functionally speaking. This is a chance to put the question to those candidates so people will know where they stand. So I'm, I think this is a local election. This is a local issue. Let's put it before the local. Let's, let's have it focused on the people who live here and not have it caught up in the noise of the, the statewide races. Anyone else? Hey, we'll close that off. Thank you, board members, for the discussion. We really appreciate that and more to come. And so next month, per um, what we've discussed, we'll look forward to more information. Those two questions before us, which is bill rate and timing of election. So thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll close that off and move on uh, to the audit report. I think Dina is going to help lead us through this. So Dina, please. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, before you in your packet, you have an audit report uh, of, that was conducted. It's our external audit conducted by the Audit Task Force, which is a few members of our board. Um, UHC is our audit firm, and they are here to give us a presentation, a brief presentation, and an overview of the audit report. But I will share with you that um, the audit has was shared with the audit task force and after that went to a briefing at the finance committee 
and, and now to the full board. So we're pleased to present this to you today and share with you that the reviews of the 2021 audit demonstrated no findings of material weakness, um, no signif significant deficiencies, and was a clean audit. Um, again, it was received by the Audit Task Force and the Finance Committee, um, and uh, questions were answered, and, and it's before you today to also answer questions or, or um, you know, make any comments that you wish to make about the audit. With that, I would like to invite our audit team from UHY forward um, to give a brief presentation about the details of the audit. All right, just making sure we can unmute here. Um, can somebody unmute Mike Santicha also? Thank you. Okay, is the screen sharing? Did I get the right one? Yes, it is. <laughs> it's always a good make sure you do the right one. So, Mike, do you want to kick it off? Sure. So, like uh, Dina mentioned, we're going to present briefly a PowerPoint presentation of the uh, audited financial statements. And like she mentioned, it was a clean opinion, um, which is the highest that we can do. And we also audited the schedules contained in the additional information, excluding the schedule of urban and non-urban regular services and the schedule of federal expenditures in which, again, we issued an unmodified in relation to opinion. You did, a, <laughs> you, uh, you did adopt a new uh, accounting policy, GASB 84, and it really added a couple of different changes um, on the financial statements. And it really was to represent the funds held in the MERS retirement health funding vehicle. Okay, and I'll go into, as opposed to going through each of the financial statements, what we do is we, we put it into you know, just graph forms, uh, make it a little bit, little bit easier to understand. Um, on the left, you'll see we have 2021, and on the right, we have 2020. Um, one of the things, if you look at, uh, just compare the pie pieces to each other, is kind of what we do, cash. And last year in 2020 was about 17 mil, about 22%. Cash this year is about 23 mil, and it's about 25%. As you'll see the greatest uh, asset that the organization has the largest uh, amount is the, your investment in capital assets, which includes your buses and the buildings and just in, in, uh, a lot of other things. The other uh, part that's substantial is your investments went from 6.9 in 2020 to 11.8 in 2021. Oops, sorry, going too quick here. Well, uh, so assets are what you own liabilities are what you owe and that position is what's left and as you can see the greatest part again here is the gray which is your net investment and capital assets which makes sense because capital assets were the biggest uh, part of the assets you had long-term liabilities went from 4.7 last year to 2.2 a uh, portion of that is your opeb liability which i've got a, the next slide to uh, describe a little bit Unrestricted net position was 20, about 24 mil last year, and this year it's up to 39 mil. That's a direct relationship of the income. And when we get to the next couple of slides, it'll go over the income and expenses. But as the, in, as the net income increases, so does your unrestricted net position. As I mentioned, the, the uh, net OPEB liability, um, I put four years on this slide just because the change has been substantial. If you uh, start in uh, the yellow, which is 2018, and then progress down to the gray, the, the orange and the blue, you'll see your, your OPEB liability in 2018 was about 1.6 million. Your OPEB liability as of the financial statements in 2021 is 87,000, substantial dis decrease. That had to do with uh, a lot of the changes in the, that were made by the organization in the plan. And if you also look under employer contributions, in 2019, there was a $750,000 deposit made into the OPEB plan to help bring that liability down. But as, you, as I said, it went from 1.5 million to 87,000. So that liability decreased immensely. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, your net uh, unrestricted net assets went up and that's a direct relationship of the income that went up. Um, and if Look, the, the greatest income change from 20 to 21 is your non-operating revenues, which is your grant revenue. And we do have a slide that describes that next, but your non-operating revenues in 2020 were about 38 mil. 
in 2021, you're looking at 53. Mm -hmm. Operating expenses were 47 and 20 and up approximately 46, seven in 2021. As I mentioned, here's the change in your net operating revenues. Uh, local revenues, as you can see, stayed uh, fairly consistent from year to year. State also was almost uh, identical, but the federal revenue went from 5 million in 22, federal grant revenue in 2021 of 19 mil. And again, that's the that's the that's where the change in your unrestricted net assets came from. The schedule of expenditures of federal awards, this is the, your federal grant revenue. As you can see, once again, so I've just mentioned repeatedly, the, in 2020, you had federal transit rev grant revenue of 9.6. Last year, it was 23.2. Once again, which reflects back to the net income, which reflects back to the increase in your net assets. Mike, you want to do these slides? And again, like Dina mentioned, uh, as part of our audit, we don't um, specifically uh, look at all your internal controls, but we do definitely look at certain key controls over your audit process. And we're supposed to communicate to you any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies. The definitions are as such next, which you just came up. And next, um, again, we did not find any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses. So the one good thing is the numbers that you are seeing to make your decisions, like you talked about tonight, are accurate. We definitely want to thank Latasha and her team for all her hard work to make our lives, make this off mm -hmm. this audit go smoothly. So we do appreciate her help there. And again, we do have to, we did do the, uh, Marlene mentioned all the increase in federal funds. We do have to look at that and we're pleased to report that you are in compliance um, with each of the major federal funds that we did test. So you are doing what you're supposed to be doing with those funds. Big thing coming up for the organization is GASB 87. GASB is Governmental Accounting Standards Boards. Um, what they're doing is in the upcoming years, they're gonna be adding leases of all types to your financial statements. Um, there will be a corresponding asset and a corresponding liability. Net effect is basically zero, but it will gross up your revenue, excuse me, revenue will gross up your assets and will gross up the liability. So what the uh, organization needs to do is take the next year um, among other, your other duties and see what, at, what, organ, what what's leased. Um, if things are immaterial, they don't have to be put on the balance sheet. Uh, excuse me, statement in that position, but um, some of the larger items you will see, if anything is leased, you will see a, a, a difference in the financial statements in the upcoming years. So something to just start thinking about. And we'd like to thank um, Latasha. I'd just like to point out that um, she does prepare the financial statements. Um, so what we do, we audit them. And the reason I bring that up is because that's unusual. Um, we assist a lot of our clients with putting together the financial statements, Latasha puts the entire packet together. The only thing that is ours is the reports. Everything else is the organizations. And I said, she, as, except for the reports, she put that entire uh, financial report together. So once again, I would like to thank her very much and everybody there that helped with this. And that is our presentation. Thank you. Mike and, and Marlene, we appreciate uh, uh, your feedback and your report. And thank you, Raymond and Kathleen, for um, operating as a task force. And thank you, Latasha. But now we know why she's so invested in making sure this goes right, because I mean, she's auditing, we're auditing her work. For, you know, so we, we know now why she's so invested in making sure we get a clean audit. But no, nothing more exciting than a clean audit and clean financial statements. Nothing more exciting than that to me. Um, you think I'm joking? I'm not joking. <laughs> Any questions from board members? I think we're good to go. Oh, Raymond? I was just going to, again, um, you know, praise staff, especially Latasha, on this. Um, you know, this is the third time I've seen this report, and it puts a smile on my face every time I hear that, you know, 
especially over a very difficult time period, right? I mean, if you just think about what the agency's gone through, what the community's gone through, and then add to that a cyber attack, which, you know, made putting together that report <laughs> that much more difficult. I think it's, it's really commendable. It is one of these things that we probably take for granted because we just expect it to come squeaky clean. But, um, you know, the fact that it did is, is definitely deserves some kudos to Latasha, Dina, and anybody else who worked on it. So, so I just want to, again, take the time to acknowledge that hard work because I know these things can be hard and difficult. Uh, I've been through some audits myself and it uh, can be a grinding experience, but to come out the other side, uh, it definitely deserves some accommodation. So, so thank you to everybody. Yep. In the spirit of Transit Employee Week, we appreciate Lou, Latasha, and we appreciate you, Dina. Thank you very much. And we appreciate you too, Matt. You don't have to raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Matt, go ahead. Oh, thank you. I did have just a clarification for Dina. Does the board need to take action on the audit? Do they need to vote to accept it formally? Uh, I don't think that we need an approval of the audit. No, okay. It's it, the audit would be what it is, whether we approved it or not. Thank so. you. I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. It's not a, approved. Do we need to vote to accept it? I don't think we have a resolution in our packet. For no, it, it would I think be. We can, we can do a voice vote for it. I think, I think it'd just be accept. by motion to accept. Yeah, can I have somebody move to accept the audit report? Ryan, seconded by Kathleen. All those in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to 4.2. Uh, we'll go over the uh, uh, policy 2.5, financial conditions, which is part of executive limitations. Uh, Dina, I think you're gonna take us through this as well. So we have the monitoring report in our packet starting on page 66. I'll let Dina walk us through. Thank you. Um, this is, uh, as, as the board chair mentioned, this is in your packet. Um, this has already, um, been also uh, presented to the Finance Committee for some discussion and feedback. And, and thank you all for your uh, responses. Uh, we did receive quite a few responses, so thank you for that. Um, how, how really this came out with the Finance Committee is that um, the Finance Committee uh, voted or, or discussed accepting the report um, as, I, as B in compliance except for items noted. And I will note that when staff presented the report, um, you may have noticed that we were transparent about uh, one item um, that we felt was not compliant. So all items we put were compliant, except for 2.5.4.1, um, which was failing to provide the board with timely information regarding fraud, suspected fraud, or financial mismanagement. And um, I'll just speak about this briefly. Uh, we did have a, an incident of check fraud, which is described in, uh, in detail in the report. Um, the incident was not a result of any uh, mismanagement or oversight on anyone or anything at the, uh, at the agency. Um, it was a, uh, an outside party that somehow uh, intercepted the check uh, between us sending it and the vendor receiving it. Um, so it, and it was caught uh, by us and our bank. The issue was resolved without any loss of revenue to the agency as it was in fact fraud that was put upon us uh, and we were the victim of, uh, of, of that. So it wasn't something that we did or, or it wasn't an, um, anything that we did internally that caused that. So again, um, that happened the same week that we hit the cyber attack. Um, so what happened was when we knew what was going to happen and how it was gonna be resolved and understood all the aspects of it, uh, it was probably a week to two weeks later and we were in the middle of dealing with the issues of the cyber attack. Um, the fraud was reported at the executive level. Uh, we were very transparent about it immediately uh, with the executive team and the intent was of course to inform the board However, with the overshadowing incidents of the uh, cyber attack being so dramatically large compared to this incident, 
um, it never made it to uh, to be presented to the board in, in any way. And going forward, we would certainly uh, provide this information in the CEO report, if not in another way. Uh, but it was an oversight on our part. And so we've noted it here to be fully transparent. In terms of comments, um, you do all have them. And they, they did range from um, understanding the situation that we were in, in terms of all the things we were dealing with and the oversight. And I think there was one comment um, that, was, that was critical of the fact that we didn't report it timely. Uh, we are reporting it, we just didn't report it in, in a more timely manner. So I just wanted to share that with you openly and take responsibility for that. Uh, and uh, that concludes my report. Thank you, Dina. Response questions from board members. Mike. Yeah, as Dana said, uh, she did present this to the Finance Committee, um, and we did, and we are recommending to the board uh, to uh, accept it as compliant, except where noted, and of course, the one place where it was noted is what Dina just talked about. Uh, the fraud was not reported as rapidly as it should have been, but let me, <laughs> she did mention it was great as they were hit with a cyber attack, and boy, I have no quarrel at all with her priorities. And I don't, unless somebody wants to discuss anything, I'd like to make a motion that the board accept this as B compliant, uh, except where noted. Okay. Does anybody want to second that? Rich, any further discussion on the motion? All those in favor then of accepting a level B, raise your hand. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. And thank you, Dina. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on then to 4.3 monitoring improvements. Mr. Alamein. Okay, I will try to make this very brief because of the time and also because the board didn't receive this material until yesterday. The reason it was yesterday um, is we didn't have our meeting of the task force until a week ago. And at that time, we had some very good discussions and we decided to um, make some changes to what had been presented to us before. Uh, to, to refresh your memories, um, Rose Mercier is really helping us out on this. And we really did like some proposals that she was making in terms of revising how we report uh, these. And she designed some forms for us to replace what we had, but we wanted to make some changes to what she gave to us. And it took, because of other things going on with staff, uh, it took a few days to get that out. So you didn't get it until yesterday. Uh, I don't think it's probably appropriate for us to discuss it tonight, given the time. But let me just give you some background that I hope that you can use to, when you do have time to look at the particular. So uh, Mike, I, I just wanna make sure people are aware these, the, the documents Mike is talking about were not in the packet. Yeah. They were sent separately yesterday, yesterday by email and they look like this. So um, don't look for them in your packet right now. They were sent to the board separately. So yeah. you um, separate if you didn't have a chance to print them off, I, I printed them off, but I didn't have a chance to go through them either. Uh, in detail. So just so people aren't looking through their package trying to find out something they might have missed, it's, it's not there. Let, let me just kind of give an overview of it. Um, an objective was to have a much more specific description of what to look for and how to answer certain questions. And so there's, a, there's material up at the top of this form that tells what you, what you should be looking at and some guidelines about it. And also uh, something that's quite different and I think makes a lot of sense that may be a little confusing is uh, we suggest that you answer the questions in a particular order and those, that order is mentioned up at the top and it's not the, the, the numerical order that's in our, um, in our manual. We think it makes a lot more sense to go from the bottom up because you can't answer the, the overall question until you look at the detail. 
So the, in the particular example we put in here is uh, 2.1, which is the uh, treatment of, of riders. And so two point, the overall 2.1 answer, you would answer last. And the ones before that, for example, you would do 2.1.3.1 before going up to 2.1.3, et cetera, et cetera. That's what that's all about. And you can see there's yes, if you have the form, there's yes and no to answer uh, specifically the interpretation reasonable. And there's some questions that help you answer that question. Then is there variable, uh, <laughs> is it verifiable evidence of compliance? Yes or no. And then there's some sub questions that help you answer that question. And if you have any no answers there, you're, there's some space there to, to explain why you answered no. There's then down at the bottom, some summary kind of questions. Um, so it, I, I hope it's much more of a understandable. You don't have to kind of interpret it on your own. And we think it's more specific and we hope it will be more helpful, but it, obviously it will have to be tried out. And I hope that our board meeting next week, even next month, I mean, even though we're going to be doing millage again, that we might have time to really look at this a little bit more and you'd have time to look at it ahead of time. Let me also mention that included in what you received yesterday was how uh, the our results of filling out this form, which will be online, will be summarized for the board. And, and so it's just an example there of, of how that might look. Uh, Rosa Maria will, was the one who helped put this together. She will, I think, be the one who will be summarizing it for us when we put it into effect. So that's all I had to say. Is there anybody else who's on the task force, which is specifically Raymond uh, or Kathleen that you wanna to add to that or any questions? Before, before we move on to our next topic. Any follow-up from anybody, Raymond, Kathleen, any questions from the board? Yep. Thank you, Task Force, for doing this. This is uh, always looking for continuous improvement, and this is yeah, one of the areas uh, we are I, doing it, I, so thank you. I think it's a, it'll be a positive step, but we can't really know until we try it out. Yep. Uh, Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Task Force. So we'll take this up again and give people a chance to study this and come back uh, hopefully next month. Let's move on then to uh, operational updates. We'll skip labor negotiations for now and go into closed session uh, after we get through the next few items, but I wanna make sure we have uh, time for the uh, quarterly reports. We'll start with the Q1 financial report. I think Dina will walk us through that and that's in your packet starting on page 694, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so our Q1 financial statement, um, we ended the quarter. Um, of course, there's some variances in, in, in the revenues and expenses, but all in all, we're, we're pretty close to on budget. Um, the unfavorable deficit or variance at the bottom that you see there would really be resolved if we had done all of the drawdowns on our state operating and uh, federal, sorry, federal operating and federal pandemic relief funds. Uh, we are in the process of applying for more as we've uh, utilized all the CARES Act funds and we're looking to move on to the ARP funds. Um, so that there's a little bit of process there, but uh, those will be caught up by the second quarter. So it's really just a matter of timing on those grants. Um, fast forwarding just a little bit, another thing I wanted to point out in the Q1 financial statement on the top of page two, uh, something that we talked about and have talked about regularly is the operating reserve. And you can see that we ended the year last year with a little bit higher reserve. And that was by design because we knew as soon as we got into this year, um, we would require a higher reserve but because of the increase in the budgeted expenses. And so that drop um, closer to our target is what we planned for and expected. And that's uh, working famously, actually. So um, we are, you know, we have enough in the reserve and just a little more, but it, it did come down a little bit based on the, the increase of expenses for this quarter. 
Um, fast forwarding just a little bit more down the page, there was discussion at the finance committee about investments. We haven't made any major changes or moves of investments um, in Q1. We're going to be looking to do some, uh, some changes in Q2, not in terms of policy or anything like that, just things um, uh, maturing and having to shift some things over. But we do have a two point, uh, another report next month um, on our, on our uh, investments. So I think that will be a good time to talk about how we're, what we're going to do and how we're making investments and, and, and what's coming and going. So I, I think we should probably look to that next month um, because there will be a monitoring report on that. So it's a perfect opportunity to discuss that in more detail. And that's my report. Unless there are questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Any questions for Dina? Mike? Yeah, I, I don't have a question. I just wanted to mention, um, I don't think, unless you unless there's something extraordinary in a first quarter report, and I don't see anything here, you can't really make any significant conclusions from looking at the first quarter. Um, we'll know more when we see a second quarter in addition to the first quarter. Um, and as Dina did point out, if the, had a gun to their head, they could have easily made this a, a profit even because of the reserve there that was not utilized. It could have been reflected, but it wasn't, and that's okay. Um, we'll, we'll just know more when we see another quarter. And we, yeah, uh, I think the finance committee was, was very happy with what we saw. Thank you, Mike. Anybody else? Okay, thank you again, Dina. Awesome. Uh, we'll move on then to uh, the quarterly report for service. I see uh, Brian is with us, so I'll turn it over to him to uh, take us through the service report for Q1. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am uh, proud to very quickly run through the service and satisfaction report highlights uh, for the board. Uh, let me start by saying there's a, a slightly new format for you to see trends over time. Uh, I won't go over all of them in detail, but will say thank you to my uh, assistant, Kelly Reynolds, who has moved on, but did a yeoman's job in getting all of this information put into a new format and makes it uh, particularly readable. So um, I will point out that uh, on the second page of the report, you can see uh, very dramatically when the <clears throat> when the pandemic hit, and then our uh, very slow recovery, and, and we have now come to a point uh, where we're starting to pick back up uh, in ridership, which is good to see. Uh, that does drive down our costs and our cost per boarding. Uh, sorry, not drive down our costs, but rather our cost per boarding. Um, going through, I'm going to just refer the board to the, the fixed route charts if you have any questions. You can also see that we have uh, a ride service charted out here and you can see where we were prior to the pandemic, the drop off and then really the a, a pretty much steady run of ridership through uh, the current uh, quarter. And I would say that what you look what you're looking at there are the folks that have to ride, that they have places that they have to get to, um, and that there are very few trips being taken that are uh, anything but essential. Uh, so I'm proud to say that we've never ceased operating that service and have been able to provide it throughout the pandemic. There is a spike in costs in Q4 of 21 uh, that is because the startup costs for our contractor are included in the uh, costs for service, but it should uh, normalize back down to, as you can see, the costs for this quarter are already back below where they had been. And uh, Van Ride uh, is also experiencing a, a bit of a recovery, um, still nowhere near our peak of, of 126, but uh, coming back up from the trough of 79. And with that, I would welcome any questions that the board might have on the report. Okay. 
Questions from the board or comments on the report? The bar charts are very good. Thank you. Any comments or questions, though? Okay. I'll just I'll just say thanks, Brian. These charts, like everyone said, is uh, very helpful. Yep. Thank you. All right. If there's no other questions. We'll close that out, um, and then move on to 5.4, the CEO report. So, Mr. Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The report's in your packet. There's uh, nothing more to add, but I'd welcome any questions. Any questions on the CEO report? All right. Um, if not, we'll move on from that and go into uh, the next item, which is to go into closed session to talk about labor negotiations. So I need a voice. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. We did. We we're going to do public comment first. You're right. Um, we'll open it back up for public comment at this time, then, if you are remote, if you're on the phone, um, I think it's uh, star nine, and if you are uh, joining us by Zoom, it is click the raise hand button. Uh, Deb, do we have anybody who wants to address the board at this time? Yes, the first one is Tim Hall, and he is unmuted. Yeah, uh, this is Tim Hall again. I spoke earlier, but I uh, just wanted to go over a couple things I know and respond to one of the responses to my thing. So one question about the whole millage thing is, is it possible? I mean, it may not be possible. This is just an idea to actually put two questions on the same ballot. One is, this is for our existing services. And two is, this is for the expansion services so that yeah, that gives a, a chance. I mean, yeah, maybe it's not the best strategy, but it's just an idea to throw out there. The other thing is, as far as services to prioritize, the one I would personally prioritize is the weekends and holidays, because that is where our service is the worst right now. And uh, right now, I mean, even like particularly Sunday, Saturdays is quite a bit better than Sundays, but Sundays we have service ending on some days before the sun goes down. And that just seems, and everything is hourly except for the four. And I think that's definitely the last thing to cut aside from like existing service. The other thing I will point out is as far as pre-COVID versus post-COVID, I get your point that COVID is not gonna factor into the long run. However, you do have, the one thing I think you should take into account is the decrease in nine to five commuters. And that is uh, something we are seeing because there's a lot more remote work. And you may wanna look at service oriented around nine to five commuters. Do we need as much there? Can we perhaps shift some of that to the off peak and have a more broad level of service that is more consistent throughout the day? The final thing I wanted to bring up is the idea of a community input meeting. I see a lot of other agencies like DDOT and I think maybe smart as well, just to nearby examples have these. Whereas AAATA mostly goes to the public when there's a millage or when there's a master plan. And other than that, the only opportunity is really the board meeting, which yeah, it's great. We could uh, speak at the board meeting, but there's a lot of stuff that's not really that interesting to the public. And a lot of stuff that the public is interested in is not discussed here. And uh, I just wanted to bring that up as an idea to do this. It's just, yeah, I mean, I know there's, yeah, like I said, there's the board meeting, but not everybody wants to sit around till 10 o'clock listening to stuff about audit. <laughs> and uh, I guess that's, that's all my comments. Hope uh, you reach a good decision on this millage. I mean, I do, I definitely like all the new service ideas, but I also want it to pass. And uh, thanks for that. Thank you. Deb, do we have anybody else? We do. Um, Mr. Jim Mogensen, you are unmuted. Yes. <clears throat> so as, as a person who has been at uh, Ann Arbor City Council meetings, who have gone even later than this, uh, when there are contentious issues, I believe that the board should at least anticipate maybe having to have a special board meeting 
um, after the April 21st meeting to at least consider consider that uh, depending depending on the conversation that emerges um, either within the board or uh, in the broader community uh, that may impact that that April 21st um, meeting, um, particularly um, trying to do ballot language on the fly with the lawyer there. Um, I have seen the city of Ann Arbor try to amend its city budget at one o'clock in the morning. You really, really don't want to do that. Um, now I want to talk about air ride. Um, so as many of you know, I um, happened to notice uh, a number of years ago um, that Greyhound had put in a public notice and I was the only person that noticed. And they said, uh, we're gonna get some, uh, we're gonna put in an application for 5311 subpart F funds, which are the inner city funds. People see a Greyhound bus and they think Greyhound bought that. And they don't realize we did. Now, as has been pointed out, Michigan Flyer had been different in that it didn't accept those. It, it, it was separated out from Indian Trails, which also gets the 5311 money. But when Air Ride had to shut down, Indian Trails said, hey, we're even on the map for inner city bus service. How come we can't access any of that money? And they finally did. And that makes them subject to oversight. Now, Inner city bus service has no oversight. It's astonishing. I've asked this question, not just not here, but at, at higher levels to try and find out what their budget is. And it's like trying to find out what the University of Michigan's parking and transportation budget is. It's incredibly difficult to find out. But I bring that up because Air Ride is branded for AATA. It is called the Air Ride. And so Indian Trails is going to make it, be making those decisions independent of, as I heard, read in the, in the CEO report, I believe, independent of the ATA. And that needs to be considered because the general public is not going to understand that depending, depending on what happens. And the final thing I would point out is that um, things like flex, the ADA, we just had the, the monthly, our Ann Arbor Reads was duty, her uh, humans uh, being human about uh, her work on disability rights. Uh, the ADA is broad, it's, a, it's an amazing thing, but it is a compromise. And there are some things that you can do to wiggle out around to make budgets work. And sometimes that can happen. And I bring that up because that's, a, that's something that, concern, that concerns me. For example, with FlexRide, ADA service is not required. Commuter routes, you're not required to have ADA service if something is determined to be in it. So I bring that up as something to be uh, uh, thoughtful about. And one final thing, I decided not to file a Title VI complaint against the August 29th um, service changes, route changes. But I wanna say I decided not to do that. And I was doing it because the, the, the report that the consultant gave you essentially was set up so that it was always going to, there was never going to be a need for analysis. Um, and that's not supposed to be happening, but I decided not to do that. But I bring that up as something, the civil rights uh, Title VI uh, circular is going to probably change in the near future. And please watch for that and take, take note of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Deb, do we have anybody else? Yes, Robert Palowski, you are unmuted. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, good evening, everyone, again. Um, so want to tag along on the long range plan, uh, put you on the spot there, Forrest. Uh, great job to everyone at the ride, including you, Forrest, for the long range plan presentation. Uh, it was a really well done plan. And I enjoyed every time being at those meetings virtually or in person to speak on this plan because I know it was really, it was thought through really good. And just to see the ride just grow to something else is great. Also left turn, right turn. Thank you again for your part on this presentation. So, you know, just keep on plowing along with this plan because it's gonna get somewhere and it'll change the system dramatically in the future. 
but I also look forward to coming on the 23rd, this upcoming 23rd to speak on this in person. So hope to see everyone there as many people from this board as well. Um, but I also like to tag on the millage again. Um, I, you know what, I am probably not the only one that wants this to pass, but at the same time, you know, there's gotta be people that fully support it. And, you know, the promoting aspect is critical to this. And, you know, just to put you on the spot, Matt, you know, I don't live in Washtenaw County, but I would definitely cut you a check for $200 just to support this millage, literally, because that's how much I want this to pass. And I'm not the only one that would probably do that that does not live in the county, but the millage is very critical to this region. College students, workers in, you know, all across this county that live near either Washtenaw or the E-Course Tyler bus, you know, and as I said in December, I will continue my part to promote this millage all across this county, as well as the smart village coming up that will be in Wayne County, Oakland, and Macomb. But this will be my main uh, center point right here is to campaign for this millage and to make sure we get the full support and the votes that we need going forward. Transit is essential in Washtenaw County, especially Ann Arbor. And I want to see this region thrive more than what it is now. And I will continue my part to definitely give you guys that extra step going forward. But just closing it off, vote yes, 2022 for this millage. And let's get the ride moving and let's keep Ann Arbor on wheels. But as always, thank you for the time and opportunity to speak and happy appreciation, uh, Transit Appreciation Day. Thank you. Thank you. Deb, do we have anybody else? Nope, that was the last of it. All right, thank you. So we'll close public comment and I need a roll call voice vote to go into closed session. So um, we're gonna take a vote to go into closed session to uh, discuss um, labor negotiations. So I will start with Mike, yes or no? <laughs> You are on mute, Mike. Yes. Okay. Kathleen? Yes. Raymond? Yes. Brian? Yes. Jesse? Yes. Rich? Yes. Susan? Yes. I'm also yes. So we are adjourned from the public board meeting going to closed session. All right, we are back on the record. Uh, the closed session is closed. We do have in our packet a resolution on the tentative agreement, uh, the signing of the contract between the AATA and uh, Transport Workers Union Local 171. Uh, that is at your table, at your desk here. Um, can I have somebody move this resolution into the record? All right, Kathleen. For, seconded by Rich. All in favor of the resolution, raise your hand. Any opposed? That I assume passes unanimously because I can't see Mr. Alamein. I just realized we didn't have him on the record. Do we have Mr. Alamein yet? All right. Sorry, I went too fast. <laughs> I <missed it. laughs> okay, I think right. I'm now admitted. Right. Can you hear me and see, see me? We can hear you. Can you see uh, me? No, nope, but we can hear oh. you. Now you can see me. We can. Uh, we're voting on the resolution of the signing of the contract between the AATA and TWU Local 171. Again, all those in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed? That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, all we have left, I think, is adjourn. We can have a motion to adjourn. Rich, seconded by Susan. All those in favor of adjournment, raise your hand. Any opposed? My gavel is gone, but we're, uh, we're adjourned. <laughs>